Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, for those of you who joined us for dinner last night, which I think was most of you, we had a, at least I had a thoroughly enjoyable time. I was just talking with Irva, and you know, we need to be doing these things more often. You know, it's just nothing like, nothing like getting together, having dinner, and getting to know each other. So we're not just pixels on a screen on a Zoom session. So anyway, good morning. So we have a number of things that we have to, uh, to do today, including uh, right out the start, I'm going to give you an, uh, an update on what's been happening at NIEHS. So let me move to the podium. David, is there anything else? Oh, actually, very, very importantly, we have uh, some retiring members of council. So I will actually present you with your uh, retirement certificates. And uh, Steve is here for Steve photographs, there. right? Steve, you're ready to go? Okay, let's start off with Irva. Actually, do you want to come up and I will... Are you heading to the podium or are you going to do it back here? Where, where should we do it? So we want we want a nice well, photograph. Go anyway, right? so yeah, let's go to the podium. You will be coming in February. Oh, okay. Yeah, you're coming in February. Well, goodbye, but, but, this is a technicality. You're, you're okay. officially retiring from council, but we're going to extend. Right. Right. <laughs> so, so we'll give you uh, government stock options in February. Okay. <laughs> so let's go to the podium yeah. and have the uh, flags in the background. Okay, so I guess I give this to you. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, I'm going to do this. So you hold on to this like this. Okay. Nice smile. Thank you very much for all of your terrific work. We'll see you in February. Okay, good. Okay, let's see. Trevor Penning. We have a few things to do. Bring you up to the podium. But she does she does have the uh, the um, first award or the the Edwards. There you go, sir. Okay, and finally, uh, Karen. Where's Karen? <laughs> okay. Great. We've got to figure out a way to re engage our retiring members of council. Oh, well. So here you go. Okay. next you are I'm up <laughs> okay so let me spend about the next 30 minutes or so updating you on a few topics that I hope you will find to be interesting so let's go to the first slide so let's kick off I know you always find the budget to be interesting and this year it's going to be well increasingly interesting <laughs> so let's start with the the third uh, third um, box over, so the FY23 omnibus. So we had a, uh, a very healthy increase this year. It was about a 3.5% increase, which is very similar to what many of the other institutes and centers of the NIH had. And I think that, uh, that reflects the pretty remarkable support from uh, both sides of, of the House and the Senate and the, and the President and the White House. So there's a lot of support for the NIH. So we also had a bump up uh, from uh, FY22. It was about a 3.5% to the labor HHS, which is our base funding, and we had a $40 million uh, bump up to support the NIH-wide efforts in climate change and health. We also saw a slight increase in the Superfund allocation from 82.5 to 83. 
We got the $10 million from the Department of Energy to support the worker training program. And there was also a $2.5 million a supplement for some of our disaster work. So that's the good news. So in, in FY23, we're actually in pretty good shape. We can continue to absorb some of the increased costs, and there's still some money left over to uh, support some of the innovative new things that we want to be doing. So if we look to FY24, so before I talk about FY24, I want to remind everyone about the discussions and debate in Congress over the debt limit. Does everyone remember those? Okay, they were, they were pretty grueling, uh, really tough. And as a consequence of that, there were uh, caps, uh, spending caps, that were set into law. And what we're discovering is that those spending caps now are limiting the ability of Congress to uh, increase the budget of the NIH. So that's kind of just where we are. So the Washington uh, discussions and politics, things that are happening in uh, Congress are directly impacting the money that the NIH will have to support the work that we do. So what does it mean relative to, well, actually just overall, and you can read, you know, listen to the news, as, as you probably did this morning, there's a lot of interesting things happening in, in both the House and the Senate, especially in the House. Uh, but the, the Senate was reasonably... I mean, they tried to squeeze out some additional money. So there was, I think, what, between three and four hundred thousand, uh, three, three to four hundred million dollars increase in the overall NIH budget. Uh, that was in the Senate. Um, in the House, uh, the proposal was for a three point seven billion dollar decrease. So there is some uh, efforts to actually, you know, significantly decrease the NIH budget. But we don't know what it's actually going to be until the budget is passed. So what we have to do is kind of hang in there and you know, continue to uh, watch the uh, you know, deliberations that are happening in Congress, and then we'll, we'll figure out where we will end up. So the three uh, figures on the right. So the president's budget, the president came in, he was pretty, well, reasonably generous uh, given the financial caps that were part of the uh, debt limit discussions. So he was proposing that we come in essentially flat for the labor HHS, but he was proposing a $25 million increase in the climate change and health. So that's what brought the, uh, the blue section here up to $939 million. Uh, he came in with flat for the Superfund program at $83 million. Uh, all the way on the right, uh, the Senate is coming in basically with a flat budget for FY24 at uh, $914 million. They're also flat for the, uh, for the Superfund program. Uh, the House, however, uh, came in flat for Labor HHS at 914, uh, although, although they're proposing a decrease uh, from 83 to $75 million for the Superfund program. So this is what we know about what's happening in both the Senate, the House, and the White House. So, but as we've discovered from the past is that we don't know what will actually happen until a budget gets passed. So the, the challenge is, so, so you know, the word that I'm getting is, you know, give, given where we are compared to other federal agencies, flat is good. Um, so you know, given the the mandated uh, caps in spending, um, there's not a lot of flexibility that Congress has to increase the, the NIH budget. So here we stand, but you know, as all of you know, inflation is not zero. Inflation isn't flat. Uh, the cost of doing science is not flat. And so we've got some real challenges as we look forward to FY25, I'm sorry, FY24, and the information that we're getting is that FY25, maybe at best, there will be a 1% increase in the budget. And of course, 1% increase in the budget isn't anywhere even close to, say, just inflation. So we've got a couple of uh, pretty challenging budgetary years, which is very different than what we've had over the last three years since I've been the director of NIHS. So it's going to be challenging. So David Belshaw and I, and well as members of senior leadership here, we've been working the numbers. And there are a number of different scenarios that David is going to take you through in his presentation 
in, in just a few minutes. So we'll go through this, and I, I'd like to have some of your input on this, because we're going to have to do some, do some things differently than what we've done in the past in order to make the numbers work out. So that's where we are. So there's a lot of uncertainty and increased costs, you know, flat budgets, and the whole question is that, you know, how do we make this work? On the other hand, we got to keep you know, the positive part of this is we still have about a billion dollars uh, that we can be spending in support of the work that's happening in the environmental health sciences community. And NIEHS isn't being penalized any more than some of the other ICs and centers. In fact, some of the others are going to be experiencing more significant cuts if, uh, well, if some of the things that are happening in Congress actually come to pass. So uh, overall, I think that uh, you know, having a, a relatively flat budget is, is going to put us in, in, a, in a better position than other federal agencies in other places. So, so let's go to the next slide. So that's the challenge with the numbers. Now, the other challenge that, you know, if you've been listening to the news, there is a lot of discussion about the, the financial management of the government. And if Congress doesn't pass a budget by the end of September, or midnight on September, what is it, midnight September 30th, uh, the government will shut down, okay? And there are reasonable possibilities that that actually might happen unless you know, different uh, members of Congress can actually come together and agree upon a budget. So if the government shuts down, let me just explain to you what that means. It means that any of us at, at the NIH, we can't do anything, okay? We can't get on our email accounts. We can't use our government cell phones. We can't, so some of us, including myself, can come on campus but we come on campus only specifically for the purpose of shutting the place down. So when they talk about a shutdown, they're talking about a hard shutdown. And it's gonna affect all of you, because we're not here to actually manage any money that we may have, so, or may not have. So it's, it's a complicated issue. So we've got our fingers crossed that uh, the government won't be shut down. So if Congress doesn't agree on a budget by the end of September, uh, they can also pass something called a continuing resolution, the CR. And so has that happened in the past? Well, the chart on the left indicates that it's actually become, I think, more of a, um, uh, a regular process in, in budget um, development in the federal government. So in the left-hand side here, from 2002 to 2022, it shows the number of days that we have operated under a continuing resolution. So in 20, 2002, there were, you know, the budget was supposed to be passed on October 1st, but there was a continuing resolution that, asked, that lasted for 102 days. The worst years were probably in 07, 11, and 13, when we operated the entire year under a continuing resolution. Last year, we were operating for about 165 days. So what does this mean? This means that it's very difficult for us to be thinking about what type of investments that we make because we don't really know what the budget would be. So we're, we're essentially moving into a continuing resolution is likely to be kind of flat, although it's not unlike what we're anticipating anyway, but it just doesn't give us some of the flexibilities that we really need to actually manage the budget going forward. So a continuing resolution is not ideal. It's certainly better than a government shutdown. So we've got our fingers crossed that uh, Congress will actually pass the budget. If they don't, they'll pass a continuing resolution and a continuing resolution that will not last for the entire fiscal year. So again, the bright side of this is that, you know, when you look at the type of science that we're doing and the things that are going on, it's incredibly exciting, okay? So the challenge that we have, I have, is ultimately working with all of you to figure out, well, how do we make investments that can really push our science forward in a way that uh, truly has a big impact? So we'll, we'll be talking about this, and you know, I'd like to get to you during the q and I'd like to get some input from all of you. And again, during David's presentation, we're gonna take you through a, series, a, a set of scenarios that we're anticipating uh, well, that we've come up with, and we want your input on, uh, you know, what are your thoughts about these different scenarios. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, let's talk about strategic planning. So this is some of the good news here. So, so Dr. 
um, Newton is in the audience. And next slide. So she has been very skillfully uh, managing the entire strategic planning process. So just to summarize, I went over this last June, but just to summarize and remind all of you that we had you know, many different mechanisms to provide for you to provide input. So we had the, there was an online input tool, eight, 87 different unique responders, uh, both individuals as well as groups provided input. We had the virtual community stakeholders workshop, you know, three different days. Uh, many of you, um, you know, joined for you know, parts of all of it and, and others joined for parts of this. There were lots of different issues, 68 different issues and opportunities were identified, 43 different breakout sessions. Now in last June, I, I actually showed you the results from the polling that went in on the third day. So there were eight different topic areas that really emerged and I think some of you had apprehensions that if it's only those eight topic areas, that's the only thing we're gonna pay attention to. Uh, well, no, it's the eight topic areas. It was useful to go through that, but let me assure you that any of the topics that were raised during the community, uh, virtual community stakeholders workshop will be part of our deliberations. So we've also paid attention over the last uh, you know, several meetings. So we've gotten lots of input from, from all of you as part of council. And we've had many different uh, NASM sponsored workshops. So there are lots of recommendations that are coming in from those workshops. So we're taking all this information. Next slide. Do I do this? Oh, okay, good. Thank you. So Sheila is very skillfully with her staff in, in uh, scope, working through and developing codes and keyword tags to curate the data, the input that's coming in. Uh, and these codes will comprise the major themes and the concepts that, uh, that all of you are raising with us. Uh, you know, each input, each, uh, each it, 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 piece of data coming in, we'll assign a code. And then ultimately, we'll use this to identify those themes and those concepts and the recommendations and novel ideas that are emerging as a result of this entire uh, strategic planning process. Next slide. So Sheila's going to be bringing uh, all of the, the data, you know, the coded data to the Senior Leadership Committee. So we will be deliberating and uh, coming up with some goals, very similar to what we did four years ago and then four years before that, or five years, four years. Um, so we'll then uh, develop some goals around what is it that we think that we can be spending our budget on that will have the biggest impact on environmental health sciences. So we'll circulate this to all of you. You're the advisory committee to me and to members of senior leadership. We'll get your input. We'll post these goals to the, on our website for public comment and hopefully in late uh, 2023. And then with the input uh, together, we will come up uh, with a final uh, draft of a plan, uh, circulate this to all of you and hopefully you'll piece this together and publish this in, I don't know, early, we still on early 2024, maybe mid-year 2024. Maybe second quarter, okay. So stay tuned and let me just thank you for all of the input that you've provided. Um, we're listening, we're coding this, and then I will be meeting together with senior leadership and we'll come up with a set of goals. So let's go to the next slide. So in the remaining time that I have, let me just go through very quickly and kind of update you on some of the, the progress we've made in some of these sci scientific priority areas that really emerged from the previous strategic plan and that we anticipate based on input will continue to be a you know, priority areas for the, the next strategic plan. So let's go to the next slide. So let's start off with the, the topic of environmental justice and health disparities. So next slide. So as I indicated yesterday, uh, there's been some progress on the whole issue of environmental justice. Daryl, good to see that you're here. Perfect timing. So Dr. Tabak, I think it was what, at the end of July, Trevor, received a, a memo from Secretary Becerra. And he very specifically asked Dr. Tabak to identify a senior leader as a point of contact for all environmental justice activities at the NIH. And he wants that person to specifically identify three strategic and transformative environmental justice actions. This is not just NIHS, but this is the entire NIH. And he's doing the same thing for other operating divisions across HHS. So 
HHS is taking the topic of environmental justice seriously. And to make sure that we make progress on this, he's asking for someone to be identified who's gonna take the lead, and we're gonna come up with three strategic and transformative ideas. And furthermore, he wants this done in the next 18 months. And in our case, uh, he wanted this done uh, to come up with these three transformative ideas in the first couple of weeks of August. <laughs> so things are moving very quickly. Next slide. So Dr. Tabeck uh, very, very carefully thought about who could lead this effort for the NIH-wide uh, environmental justice uh, planning, and he chose our uh, deputy director, Dr. Archer, uh, to lead this effort. So Dr. Tabeck and Dr. Schwetz uh, chose Dr. Archer, and Dr. Archer then very quickly pulled together a, a coordination team with the individuals that you can see on the slide, Sharon Beard, Liam O'Fallon, Lindsay Barton, Moses Marr, Serena Silvera, and they worked then feverishly over the course of, what, a couple of weeks? And not just amongst themselves, but actually reached out across the entire NIH, 27 different ICs, used their communication networks, and then came up with three of those transformative and strategic ideas. Next slide. So I want you to pay attention to this because I want your input on this during the Q&A. So the first one is to really build on what is a, a very successful center of excellence in environmental health disparities. I mean, currently this is a, uh, a center's program that NIEHS is doing in collaboration with NIMHD and, and, and NICHD. It's really about this multidisciplinary research capacity building and community engagement, heavy on the community engagement. So what they're hoping to do is that, let's expand that. Why is it just NIMHD? Why is it NICHD and NIHS? And can we expand this health disparities program, the center, to also include topics of environmental justice? So that's the, the first transformative and uh, strategic idea. The second idea really builds from the very successful a scholar, we're gonna call it the Environmental Justice Scholars Program. Now you may recall in June, I told you about the Climate Change and Health Scholars Program. So that turns out to be just enormously successful, wildly successful. So this is an opportunity then to bring scholars with diverse expertise in environmental justice, bring them to the NIH. And these could be community leaders, it could be academics, healthcare and government workers bring them actually either virtually or physically to the NIH, working together with staff in all of the institutes and centers across the NIH and building greater awareness and building programs in environmental justice. So that's the second uh, strategic and transformative idea. The third is building on the wildly successful, I mean, we have a remarkably successful worker training program as part of the Superfund uh, 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 allocation. So this is about building an environmental justice training program. So it's about getting out, using the framework of the worker training program and getting out to communities, to workers, researchers, healthcare and public health professionals, policymakers, to build uh, capacity, uh, community capacity and to bring increasing awareness to the issues of health disparities and environmental justice. So these are the three different uh, strategic and transformative areas, and again, we can talk more about this during the Q&A. So thanks again for uh, you know, Trevor, for his leadership in this, as well as all members of the team, as well, I don't have the list of people, but there are lots of people across the NIH who are actually not only interested, but I think pretty passionate about this issue of really embedding environmental justice into the framework of what we do at the NIH. Next slide. So let me go through again uh, and just give you a little update on, on uh, some you know, things that are happening in the climate change and health uh, area, strategic area. So next slide. So just very quickly, you will recall that the working group, the NIH-wide working group, has come up with this uh, framework for uh, studying the health effects or climate, uh, climate change and health. So there are four different central focus areas, health effects research, health equity, intervention science, and training and capacity building. It's all done with an unprecedented degree of transdisciplinary 
um, you know, transformative uh, research and collaboration. And as you can see on the periphery, as I've taken you through before, uh, there are many different areas of research focus that are going to be necessary to implement on this uh, multifaceted and complex uh, strategy to address the health effects of climate change. So again, if you're, uh, this isn't going away, so if you're really interested in this and you're not aware of the details, NIH.gov forward slash climate and health, take a look. Uh, there's a lot of really good information on that website, as well as a description of what the, the obviously we call it the COG diagram, all of the elements of the COG diagram. So next slide. So some of the progress we've made is in one of those areas called disaster research response. This is all about promoting climate-related disaster research response capacity. And you can see here, actually interestingly, about 25% of the climate change and health grants are disaster-related. So this is a big area, big area of focus for our climate change and health initiative. Now, the, specifically, I want to highlight some of the leadership that Aubrey Miller brought as well as other members of the steering committee, as members of the working group for climate change and health, they decided that what we need to do is reach out to the National Science Foundation. And they want to develop this partnership with NSF because they really feel that this is critical to bring climate change, uh, climate science, and the related disciplines supported by NSF into the, the work that we do on the NIH climate change and health uh, into our community of practice. So by developing this partnership, they hope, to, uh, they hope that this will catalyze the types of transdisciplinary collaborations that will be necessary to implement on our strategy. It will combine tools and platforms. Uh, it will augment the uh, NIH climate change and health data integration. Uh, it will also foster the, the type of downstream funding and deeper scientific proposals. It's really getting out, and we talked a lot yesterday about the need for different agencies of the federal government to work together. This is a tangible step in that direction. So thanks to Aubrey and to Josh Rosenthal and other members of the steering committee, the working group, and actually Glenn, uh, Gwen Coleman for all of her leadership in this program. So next slide. And one tangible element of this collaboration is to bring some of the resources that are part of the NS NSF funded, it's called the RAPID uh, program. So this uh, provides access to um, the health-focused sensors, instrumentation, uh, support, service for, for, uh, support services for data processing and training. It really provides access to our grantees, uh, provides access to the expensive, highly technical equipment, you know, the, the maintenance associated with that equipment, calibration, as well as the needed training so that our grantees know how to use that equipment. So we'll be using one and a half million in FY23. Uh, to support this partnership with the, the, the National Science Foundation. So again, we, we thank the executive committee, uh, looked at this and thought that this is a, a great way to actually leverage the, uh, the budgets that we have and not duplicating the effort, but working collaboratively with another agency of the federal government. Next slide, please. Okay, I also want to call to your attention, it's on the NIH.gov forward slash climate and health, you know, the Fogarty International Center, in support from the steering committee and the working group of the Climate Change and Health, is very interested in, it's got a call for proposals on case studies to advance research on climate change adaptation strategies. Fogarty, as well as you know, the Climate Change and Health Init Initiative, is very interested in, in the, the whole issue of adaptation. I mean, if you're not aware of it, climate change is with us, and we also have to study uh, and, to, uh, and to identify and to understand any current and historical climate adaptation strategies. And this is especially true for under-resourced and marginalized populations in, in the LM, LMICs. So if you're interested, uh, the deadline is October 16th. Eight to 12 of these proposals will be developed into full case studies. So stay tuned. Again, the details on this are the Climate, climate and Health website. website. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, okay, so, so someone, someone, I'm getting, so did someone turn on their computer? Okay, okay, microphone's off, great. I also want to remind everyone that uh, it was really Daryl uh, uh, Zeldin, our scientific director, really took the leadership early on, working together with the steering committee and the working group to bring our intramural research program into the, into the fold. 
we have a lot of capabilities within our intramural research program, and we wanted to make sure that there was uh, engagement. So there were three different things that uh, have been happening over the last year. Uh, so we developed this, this program. It's the Intramural Targeted Climate Change and Health Program to promote uh, health effects of climate change research in the NIH Intramural Program. So it's abbreviated ITCH, okay? It's not my acronym, but uh, it's ITCH. So one of the first things they did was, uh, it's nothing like a little bit of funding. So a little a pilot project here or there to get people interested. Uh, the second is to really build a new intramural laboratory, a branch uh, that's dedicated to climate change and health. And I'll give you an update on that in a second. As well as generally speaking, um, you know, this, this new laboratory head would pay attention to making sure that we're building the infrastructure within the intramural NIH program to help foster work in climate change and health. So next slide. So there's been a lot of interest in the pilot projects for the itch. Uh, there's an RFA. Uh, there have been 14 letters of intent. Uh, 11 different ICs are represented in these letters of intent. You know, there are senior investigators, tenure track investigators, others, you know, staff scientists, lots of interest, which is exactly what we were hoping to do. So they'll be making some decisions about how, how to allocate the money. It's a relatively modest amount of money uh, in this. Uh, I'm actually pleased to say that the deputy director for intramural research um, has actually tossed in a, you know, a sizable amount of money to help to support some of these pilot projects. Next slide. So I also want to uh, call to your attention that there is currently a, a job search out for that chief of the Center for Climate Change and Health Research, the CCCHR. And so this would be an individual that we're recruiting here to NIEHS, but it's not an NIEHS branch, it's a NIH-wide branch. So it's, it's, it's carving out a new model for collaboration across ICs. So they'll be physically based here, but this will be a collaborative effort with other institutes and centers across the NIH. And again, it's about building you know, a cadre of scientists in the, in the intramural program interested in climate change and health research. So if you're interested, or if uh, you know of others that may be interested in providing this leadership for the program, you know, careers.jobs uh, at nihs.nih.gov. Next slide. So I also want to just comment that, uh, so the, the, the advisory committee for the director, the ACD, so there are very select few topics that Dr. Tabak and Dr. Schwetz select to present to the ACD. And I'm very pleased to say that I was selected on behalf of the entire executive committee for climate change and health to actually present the climate change and health initiative to the ACD. And it was very enthusiastically embraced. So uh, I think this tells us that uh, both Dr. Well, senior leadership of the NIH uh, as well as the ACD were very, uh, very interested in this topic area and you know, based on the questions we got and some of the, 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 the feedback is that this is clearly an expansion area um, for the NIH. The next slide. Let me talk a little bit about the exposome. We talked about that a bit yesterday, so let's go through this here quickly. So next slide. And of course, just reminding everyone that this is about the totality of exposures over the life course. And it's not just the different things in the lower box, you know, being those physical and chemical assortment of exposures, but also integrating the social ecosystem and lifestyle variables into studying the exposome. Next slide. And Gary, I'll just remind everyone that again, it's, I think you were one of the first to really, def we have to define, uh, develop an operational definition of what is the exposome. And so that's uh, clearly something that we're, we're still working on. Um, so how do you do an exposome experiment? How does Francis Collins do an exposome experiment? So what data do you collect? Where do you put it? So there are lots of different elements of this. Now, this has been a, uh, an ongoing topic of discussion amongst the exposome community. So next slide. In fact, Roland Vermillion, uh, who's been a partner with Gary, and actually a partner across the European exposome community, has really been working uh, to develop uh, an operational definition. We actually put together a conceptual framework, and he uh, has developed this, uh, this article. It's kind of a perspective article. He shared it with me and with David Belshaw and uh, Yusha Shui and others here at NIEHS. 
And I asked him, uh, well, I'm giving this presentation to council. Um, Joel, Roel, do you mind if I share the slides? He said, here they are. So I'm sharing you the slides that uh, Roel presented to me. And so the, the conceptual framework for the Exposome Research Program is really all about, the premise is about a holistic approach to environmental health. I don't think that's any surprise to any of us. But he was very specific uh, to point out that this is different, it's complementary from uh, to the, the traditional approaches that uh, many of us use in the environmental health sciences community for collecting data. So not everything that we do is exposomics research. There are some members of the community that feel that exposome is just a fancy new term for the type of work that we've already, always done and we will continue to do. But what Roel has done in this, in the, and his colleagues have done in this, uh, in this article is really define that it's, it's different. So it's a conduct of research is fundamentally different when you're doing exposomics experiments versus doing environmental health sciences. I mean, I liken this to genetics and genomics. Okay, genomics is different than genetics, but they're both of them are important. So next slide. So this is the, so what does this look like? So this is the how of the exposome research program. So it's really about the first element here is about a comprehensive exposure assessment. So coming in with technologies, and if we don't have them yet, developing the new technologies so that we have a comprehensive sense of what are the stuff, what are the things in the environment, whether it's physical, chemical, or psychosocial, or other elements that all influence human health. The second element of this is understanding the bodily responses to the exposures. So how does an individual with their, say, unique biological makeup, how do they respond to this uh, cascade of different environmental exposures in a way that is either going to improve their health or um, uh, be, be deleterious to their health. And the third uh, component to this is the integration of what he calls fragmented health research silos. So there are people doing proteomic science, there are people doing transcriptomics, there are people doing metabolomics, and they're working all over here, and the rest of us are working all over here. So we have to, as part of this exposome framework, get these people working collaboratively together. And that's the diagrams that he's showing on the right. So getting the biology, the chemistry, and the environmental research all intersecting. Not everything we do is intersecting, but if you're doing the exposome research, it's really at this point of intersection. So in, you know, in an email he sent me, he said, exposome research is an interdisciplinary research program that wants to innovate on several fronts to make possible a novel pathway to understanding environmental health. So Gary, I'll, I'll ask you during the Q&A to uh, chime in on this. Uh, I suspect you may have a few things you wanna say. So let's go on. So how are we gonna help to make all of this happen? So there's clearly a lot of planning that needs to happen. So you gotta get a lot of the, so it's our challenges uh, to get the butterflies flying in formation. So we gotta get everyone working in sync with each other. And I'm very pleased to announce that uh, yesterday, what was it, at noon, uh, Yusuf Shri sent an email to the community that the NOFO that we talked about, I think it was last June, has now been issued. And this is to create the Center for Exposome Research Coordination. So this is a center that will be charged with figuring out how do we pull all these things together. So how do we develop the type of collaborations and the data sharing networks and, and all sorts of other things that will develop a conceptual framework to address exposomics, that will promote technologies and methods development uh, or using best practices for current methods and you know, approaches for data sharing. It will also be about building an exposome a research community that fosters national and international collaborations. So we got to do it right. There's a lot of work that's happening, for example, in Europe. So we don't want to be working independently of them. We want to be working synergistically with them, and we will. So this was issued yesterday. Uh, so the uh, applications are due on November 30th. So the funding is it's a five-year program. It's uh, $1.55 million in, in FY24. So if you're interested, uh, take a look. Uh, Take a look, and uh, if you can't find it, let me know. I will point you to the NOFO. Next slide. So in the interest of time, I'm just gonna say that um, there have been a number of other ICs that are very interested in the exposome and uh, following some of the leadership at NIEHS on exposome science. So there was a, a NOFO that we participated in writing uh, issued from uh, uh, 
NIAMS, and uh, Lindsay Criswell, the director of NIAMS, has is, is been just an incredible uh, and, and very, very, very involved partner in exposomic science. So, uh, so that's another no flow that's out there. Next slide. Okay, let me go on now to the, the concept of precision environmental health. So next slide. Again, just a reminder, we talked about this uh, you know, the last couple of times. This is a, a program I learned about from uh, Walker, Baccarelli, and Bill and I a couple of years ago. And it's really the concept of trying to figure out how do we bring all of our science together in a way that we can uh, better understand individual variability in responses to environmental, uh, to the exposome. So it complements the Precision Medicine Initiative, but it goes beyond just genetics. It involves the environment. It involves, uh, say, epigenetics. So the goal is to really integrate genetics, epigenetics, and omics data. Next slide. And we talked a bit about this yesterday. The, you know, for the genetics part of this, there's no single gene that's going to be, or gene variant, that's responsible for all the differential exposures. It's going to be a set of complex traits, which means that there may be potentially hundreds of different allelic variants in a given individual's genome that may be contributing into the ways that they differentially respond to an environmental exposure. So we don't, as the environmental health sciences community, we don't have to do this on our own. We can actually collaborate. And you know, Gary actually referred to the collaborations. Well, you've heard yesterday about the All of Us program. Uh, Gary referred to the collaborations that are happening with the UK Biobank. Well, there, there are these genetics and genomics people out there that are collecting these large cohorts. And they have large biobanks. And they're sequencing the genomes. So let's work with them and then convince them that you know, if you really want to understand, say, precision medicine, you know, you've got to collect environmental exposure data. You've got to overlay the exposome into the way that you collect your phenotype data. So that is what we're doing. And in fact, next slide. The good news is, as you heard yesterday from Josh Denny, you know, the, he doesn't need to be convinced, nor does Jeff Ginsburg, who is the chief medical and scientific officer at uh, the All of Us. They don't need to be convinced that the environment has an effect. In fact, this is, uh, they're very interested. Next slide. There, and, and Josh went through this uh, yesterday. So there's really phase one and phase two. And so really the, the, the easy thing that we can do right off the bat for the 600,000 individuals is get their addresses and their zip codes and put that information in so that we can then use GIS data. So that's been uh, our contribution. So I, I really thank many of my colleagues here at NIHS, both intramural and extramural, for bringing this awareness uh, to Jeff and to Josh and others in the All of Us program. Next slide. And as we all know, once you have the GIS data, you can do some very powerful things. Integrating the global air quality models, you know, getting a better sense of who was exposed to some of that wildfire smoke coming from Canada. Um, so it just it, it gives us incredible capabilities. And so the opportunity for environmental health sciences now is to be able to go in and actually use this data as part of the all of us and to develop the strategies to better understand what do these uh, exposures from GIS data mean relative to health and to potentially conduct those gene by environment studies. So you can couple the genetics and genomics work that's happening with all of us with the environmental exposures. Next slide. But we're also moving on to a more comprehensive approach. We call it the phase three study. And this is really about getting beyond just the GIS coordinates, but taking a, you know, the all of us cohort, or it could be the UK Biobank or other um, genetics and genomics cohorts, where you have whole genome sequencing, whole genome transcriptome and proteome and everything else uh, with their health records, their extensive surveys on lifestyle and social determinants of health, as well as a thorough analysis of biospecimens that are available uh, through these different cohorts. So we call stage one, there's a case study. And uh, the case study is uh, actually Dr. Belshaw and uh, Yushif Shui and uh, uh, Alison Motzinger Reif and Jan Hall and others are working together with the All of Us program. So let's take 1,500 uh, type 2 diabetics and 1,500 controls and let's go through and you know, take their whole genome sequence, but let's take those biospecimens and analyze them in great detail. Next slide. Using the HERE program, the HERE resources that we have, and I don't have time to go through all the details, but there are lots of different things. You know, met metabolites and food metabolome, 
you're taking all these different variables and then adding it to the uh, synthesis of information uh, relating to individuals with type 2 diabetes or the controls. Next slide. And then in the end, kind of pulling this all together. You start with the genome, you go to the exposome, you add the societal social determinants of health, you know, the phenotypes from the electronic health records, and ultimately bring this together in a way that we can better understand gene by environment effects. So that is underway. Next slide. And I just want to call to your attention that we do have the PEG study, which is an intramural program here. It's being spearheaded by Jan Hall, uh, who's our clinical director, and uh, Dr. Matzinger, uh, uh, Allison Matzinger Reif, uh, who is uh, one of our branch chiefs in the uh, Division of Intramural Research. So they have the PEGS program. It's a smaller, it's almost a mini all of us program. Uh, but we think that there are ways that we can use the PEGS program as a kind of a pilot uh, uh, resource to uh, begin to look at the impact of the environment uh, and to do the types of gene by environment experiments that could ultimately be translated to the much larger um, cohort of all of us. So stay tuned on that. Next slide. So just uh, winding up here, working collaboratively across the NIH. Next slide. So I'll go very quickly here. So the East Palestine owned Ohio train derailment. We've gotten a lot of input. I've gotten a lot of input from Congress, especially the two senators from uh, Pennsylvania and from Ohio, and they want NIHS to do something about this. And so the approach that we've done in the past is NIHS mounts a response, and then we try to figure out what we can do uh, to evaluate what's happened in those communities. Um, but you know, under uh, Aubrey Miller's leadership and others at the NIH, we don't have to do this on our own anymore. There are other institutes and centers that are interested in um, you know, it's health research and surveillance. Um, so we have now joined forces with uh, NCI, NIA, and NICHD, NIMH, NINDS, and CDC, and we're putting together a collaborative effort uh, to sponsor a National Academy workshop. And the National Academy, it'll be a two-day virtual workshop, so pay attention to this. The, the notices will be coming out. It's really about, you know, the studying the exposures associated with the train derailment, you have physical, mental, social, behavioral health impacts, acute and long-term health impacts of exposure, um, you know, surveillance regarding health risks. So from the National Academy workshop will be a set of recommendations on what we can be doing to actually assist these communities and looking forward. So again, NIHS doesn't have to do it on our own. It can be more of an NIH-wide and actually with CDC. It's great to have other federal agencies working collaboratively with the NIH as something that you know, you're gonna hear more of this, I'm very passionate about getting people working together. So it's really a tribute to, again, Aubrey and to others uh, uh, for really pulling this together. Next slide. So uh, I actually presented, uh, Lindsay Criswell invited me to present to uh, NIAMS Council. And I talked about the exciting stuff that we do at NIHS, and they're very excited to be working with us. So next slide. So DEI updates, next slide. So we, I want to make sure everyone's aware of the uh, Olden Lecture. So we have Anna Dees uh, Rue, who will be coming. She's the director of the Drexel Urban Health Collaborative. Um, she's internationally known for her research on the social determinants of population health and the study of how neighborhoods affect health. So that will be happening next week. I can't believe that that's the middle of September already. Where's 2023 going? So we're really excited about having her with us and uh, it's in having her honored by giving the Olden Lecture. Next slide. So we have uh, actually Dr. Dr. Archer is working uh, with, uh, with us in the, in the office of the director to hire what we call the scientific diversity officer. So this will be a key senior level position here at NIEHS. Uh, you know, I've talked about this in the past. It's really someone who we're going to be looking to to bring a leadership around DEIA related activities. Uh, the search committee is currently being chaired by our associate uh, director for management um, and the deputy executive officer, Robbie Robinson. And so we have a final candidate. So the all hands seminar will be on September 15th. So I'm looking forward to uh, actually hearing the seminar and meeting this person and hopefully we will identify this individual. Next slide. Okay, so lots of things happening. Um, so we have formed the DEIA Council. Uh, this is a, an attempt to really get a, to bring a unified approach to current DEIA activities across the NIH. 
and to foster within the NIH uh, the, the values that promote diversity, inclusion, equitability, equi equity, and accessibility. So uh, this will be chaired by that science diversity officer once we hire them. But in the meantime, uh, Dr. Dr. Archer will be stepping in and will be the interim chair of the uh, diversity DEIA council. So this remains open to all uh, employees, the trainees and contractors across NIHS. Next slide. And we also have, just in the interest of time here, we, we have a mentoring program. And so it's not just uh, enough to have councils, uh, but we have a program where we're actually reaching out to staff across the NIH. And so there are mentoring uh, capabilities, mentoring tools uh, for growth in diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, and we've included civility. So DEIA-C. So this is uh, being co-led by um, Jay Mathis. Uh, I don't know if Jay is here. And uh, together with our union president, we have a union uh, here, and she has uh, developed a very close and a collaborative working relationship with our union. And so it's terrific that they're bringing this uh, very powerful mentoring capabilities to our staff. So next slide. So very quickly, next slide. So Paul Dosh uh, was elected a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry. Anat Parekh has been awarded the annual review prize from the Physiological Society. And Chandra Jackson has achieved tenure in our Division of Intramural Research, which is a real accomplishment. So we're really proud of, of all of these awards and we're proud of our staff. <laughs> Next slide. And let's see, I also want to just remind everyone that Dale Sandler has been uh, the, you know, in charge of the, the sister study. We are celebrating the 20th anniversary of this, this incredibly successful program. 50,000 women enrolled you know, over the last 20 years, still 90% are still participating. You know, 300 papers are published. It's remarkable the, uh, the scientific progress we've made uh, using this cohort. Uh, so Dale will be giving the uh, distinguished lecture at the NIH on September 20th. Uh, it will be, I believe, video conference. And so I, I encourage you to, uh, to log in on that. Uh, we've also, with uh, uh, Christine Flowers and her staff in, in OCPL, have developed a 10-minute video. Uh, it'll be posted on YouTube on the Sister Study History, the accomplishments, and this will be in both English and in Spanish. So next slide. And I also want to point out that Steve Novak uh, so our chief of our health and safety branch um, has been awarded the HHS Secretary's Commendation for the incredible leadership that he brought to NIHS during the COVID uh, period. So it, uh, it's truly remarkable. Steve worked with you know, people across NIHS, and at least that I'm aware of, there were no examples of any transmission of COVID-19 on campus. So, and it's because of the remarkable and diligent efforts that Steve and his colleagues and others throughout the Office of Management and actually across the NIEHS. So lots of, lots, lots of people who worked hard under Steve's leadership. Next slide. And it's just the final slide here is I want to acknowledge the Green Labs program. So this is a partnership between OM's Health and Safety Branch and our two intramural research programs. So uh, in June, we recognize 27 labs, 77 individuals for their outstanding efforts in conducting and supporting environmentally sustainable research. So there are four different programs, our Green Researchers, Freezer Challenge, Green Labs, and Green Champions. So we are practicing the science that we do. So congratulations to the, uh, these individuals. Next slide, and I think that's it. Well, okay, so quickie. So we have uh, a search out for the, uh, the next scientific director for a divisional translational toxicology, three individuals interviewed for the job. And we are now at the phase where we're choosing the, the next uh, person. And this is all now under uh, consideration in our, in our HR department. So no one, there are no public uh, declarations can be made yet. Uh, so stay tuned. And I hope that I will have a definitive announcement to make to all of you next February. Okay, I think that's the last slide. So thank you all, and uh, let's go in. And so, David, do we have a little flexibility going yeah, beyond? Yeah. Uh, so can. let's let's open it up for a Q and A. Let's stop the slides, and so okay. Yes, first question. Well, actually, 
think David, can you can you kind of coordinate the questions that are coming in, coordinate the people in the room with the people who are attending online? So first question. Yeah, so probably quick, the Center for Ex Ex Exposome Research, mm -hmm. um, is it one award? It's one award, a five-year okay. award, and it's- It's just uh, one, one group will get it. One right? group will get it, and the, and the purpose there is that we want one group to really take a leadership position and to coordinate things amongst the entire community. So we don't want you know, different groups yeah. competing with each other. One place that, uh, that's, you know, it's a sizable amount of money. So uh, we're, we're looking for real leadership. David, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I was just going to emphasize that it, it is, it's really a coordinating center, so it's intended to be facilitating a conversation involving the entirety of, of the, the global community, not just in the United States, but working. Um, the European Union has stood up a parallel center, so th really having those two working in partnership uh, to, to coordinate. Okay. So next, uh, so David again coordinates, so are there any questions coming in online? But you, you coordinate here. I think Andrew Geller was next and then Irva. Okay. I have quite a few comments in quite a few different areas. How about the first one? But I'll, okay. I'll, I'll, start, I'll, I'll start with EJ and, and, and health disparities. Um, because I, I, I appreciate these, um, these, these st strategic and transfer, transformative actions. Um, and I'd like to see you push a little bit harder for really transformative actions. Um, so when we talk about expanding a centers of excellence program, centers of excellence are centers of excellence. They are not full coverage. They are not embedding mm -hmm. environmental justice and equity into everything you do, which mm -hmm. is the order that we've gotten from the White House. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and so I, I, I ask, you know, how, how is this being embedded into your program and into other programs? Are you all contributing to and familiar with the HHS Equity Action Plan? I assume that each IC is not responsible for putting together an Equity Action Plan. And that will be done, uh, and actually I'll ask Trevor to respond to this, but that will be done on an NIH-wide level. Um, so, go ahead. And, 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 and I guess if, if we're really thinking broadly, you know, would as we think about things like the exposome, and I mean, EJ is is an environmental health issue, yep. and and it's the exposome. So there's a couple of things about the exposome. I think we have to think about. Um, first, we have to think about the that all of these exposures that we deal with actually occur within the social exposome. So mm -hmm. it's not the social exposome and the built-in chemical exposome. And mm -hmm. it, it is, they are, there's, mm -hmm. there's a nested construct. And, and I guess if I think about the ICs and all of the incredible research that, that NIH broadly does on health, would incorporating an IC-wide exposomic approach that recognizes the profound influence of environment on health equity Mm -hmm. be a transformative um, response. Mm -hmm. It's not an, a, a training program. It's not a center. This is, this is recognizing once and for all, it's, it's saying genome's important, but we know the, the, the environment accounts for 50 to 85% of health and who is most affected mm -hmm. by health and health equity. And so if the exposome is the way to do it, then, then to mm -hmm. me that would be uh, 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 yep. something. Well, let me pause for a second. Trevor, do you want to uh, comment on this? Just keeping in mind that the Trevor, the team, and the working group had two weeks to come up with uh, different things. So, and, and furthermore, it's not, it's not that these are the only things that we're going to be doing um, in the area of environmental justice. I, I think all of you know, and if you don't know, I'm going to tell you that environmental justice has been part of the fabric of the way that we do our science. And the, just from my point of view, the, the most important thing about the exposome, that's why I show that diagram you know, from Gary's, Gary's paper, it's, it's not just about the physical chemical exposures, but it's all of the different things, and that has to be integrated. And a lot of that overlays with environmental justice. But I'm sorry, Trevor, go on. Go ahead. 
Uh, thanks, Rick. Uh, Andrew, you know, I, I certainly uh, sort of both agree and I'm sympathetic to things that you say. The one thing I would say is, one, is that this is really the, the, the first draft in that we were, you know, within that two-week period, we also had to assemble the uh, group of people to be involved and get organized. And so what we're going to be doing is, you know, meeting, uh, you know, regularly forming a, a working group uh, that will consist, again, of this sort of broad representation across NIH, and so it, and it's really important to emphasize that what we're trying to do, as you said, which is to really to bring this to all of the ICs, not NIH. I think we have, uh, and we can be proud of our, you know, historical uh, commitment to EJ that's gone back, you know, you know, decades. But what we're trying to make sure is that this is really incorporated across the NIH system, as opposed to simply just the uh, the NIHs. And so it has to be done collaboratively. And as you know, we have a, a federated system in the ICs, which are our independent, and so we're going to. Have to bring that together, and so that's the the challenge is going to be uh, coordinating that. And you know, fortunately, there are a, a number of, of really uh, dedicated uh, individuals uh, at NIEHS already who are working on that. And we have, you know, in particular, I'll just you know call out uh, uh, Sharon uh, Baird, who's worked again with the White House and that, and Melissa Smar, who's been actually part of the. OEJ and HHS and putting together a number of polls. So I think we're going to be well positioned to, to provide leadership with this, and so we're really looking forward to trying to do that. A, a quick question, and, and, and Sharon, I can ask you. So are, is, is NIHS, or how is N, NIH represented at the new OSTP, CEQ, and STC uh, Environmental mm -hmm. Justice Council? So part of EO 14096 was this new White mm -hmm. House level council. Sharon needs a microphone. Sharon, you may have to come forward. Sharon, there back to the podium. Uh, yeah. Actually, it's, uh, this is an important enough question that uh, come on up and use both, both microphones. We'll have you in stereo. First of all, could you repeat the group? I want to make sure I'm, I'm, I'm referring to the right organization. In so this is the National Science and Technology Council Environmental Justice Council that was established by joint, in joint collaboration with the Office of Science and Technology Policy and the, um, what is it called, the Environmental, uh, the Council on Environmental Quality in the White House. Okay. And, so the, and this was part of the latest in, uh, executive order. Right. Well, one of the things that we're working with right now is Anna Mascarenas, who is off uh, working on HHS to help implement Executive Order 14086. Um, I think that was the actual executive order that was passed in April. Um, and helping to develop this process within HHS and also with, uh, with um, uh, the White House. Uh, we're really focusing on trying to actually gather all of the information and all the resources and tools that we have across um, HHS and the other federal agencies to bring it to the group to determine how we're going to best represent our activities there. And so that's the focus right now. We're actually getting ready to have a meeting uh, with that out of the White House. Just got an email message this morning about how we're going to help implement this process. And so we're working with her and um, Sharenda Buchanan to develop this process about how we're going to work. And I have to say that the, the information that you shared about the Expo Zone and pulling together those types of activities, these are the types of conversations that we're going to be having with the rest of the other institutes because we know that this work is, is important and, uh, and that is a way of being able to incorporate all of these activities. Uh, and we're very much so looking forward to having those conversations with the rest of NIH to develop how we're going to strategize and then work in collaboration with HHS to make this happen. Thanks, Sharon. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? It does. Okay. I'll just add, uh, Andrew, we're, that meeting actually will take place on Monday, uh, the 18th at uh, 3, uh, 4.30. <laughs> so so just, uh, just as a comment here, Sharon, I also encourage you, you know, as we've done for the last two council meetings, you know, environmental justice is a big focus of effort at, at the EPA. So let's be absolutely certain that there's points of intersection. So as you're working now to really bring together an NIH-wide awareness, you know, let's also factor that into the work that's happening at the EPA. I mean, very, I mean, we're doing very tangible things. For example, I think, Andrew, you're going to be joining me uh, for a community forum in Mevin. Is that right? Or someone from EPA will be joining? And so that's where we want to get out in front of our community. So it's not just NIEHS but it's also a broader 
representation from across the federal government of how do we take on some of the big challenges of environmental justice. So I'm just wondering, maybe is there a, a, actually a, a definitive point of intersection? So is there someone at the EPA that you can be working with, or maybe you're already doing that? So other, other questions? So, so Rick, we're 20 minutes behind, so I think in the interest of time, it might be better if we jump into my presentation, because I think okay. we'll want to have some conversation there as well. Sounds good. And then we, you know, I'm sure that that's going to generate a few questions and comments as well. So thank you all. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to try to move through this quickly so we can reserve some time at the end for some conversation. Um, tried to keep the, 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 the presentation as bare bones as possible because um, uh, you really re would rather hear from other people, not me. So uh, just some updates on staffing, uh, highlighting a few activities that we have uh, undertaken since the June meeting and some things that we'll be doing between now and February. Uh, and then the bulk of the presentation is going to be having some conversation around fiscal 24 funding strategies. So I told you in June that we had 30 active recruitments underway in DERT with a staff of 81. Um, so uh, a, a lot of, of, of hiring activities uh, and I can uh, introduce you to a, a few people, uh, new people and people in new roles uh, in the, the, the division. Um, we will have at least six more I, that I know of uh, to present to you in February. Um, and that's where we are right now. We're just in the process of onboarding people. Um, so first, um, and we're going in alphabetical order, uh, Kathy Allmark uh, in the back of the room and the worker training program, you'll hear from her in a little bit. Um, she's actually moved into a new role, uh, transitioning from being a program analyst to being a health specialist in the worker training branch, expanding some of her, her, her scope and role uh, working in, in that. Uh, another new employee in the worker training uh, branch is uh, Dr. Eric Persaud, uh, also in the back of the room. Um, uh, he is, um, has been working, actually, he was trained uh, in the worker training program uh, and has been working with them as a contractor for a couple of years uh, and have, has uh, taken the position that was formerly held by Demia Wright, um, uh, really working on, on some of their program officer function as well as uh, a lot of their writing and evaluation efforts. Uh, Ashlyn Quinn, I don't think Ashlyn is with us today. Um, she's a, a new program officer in the population health branch. Um, she comes to us from uh, uh, most recently the, the Berkeley Air Group, uh, but uh, had formerly worked at the Fogarty International Center on clean cook stoves. And she is going to be working as the program officer uh, for a lot of our new climate change and health uh, activities uh, within DERT. Caleb Rogers is a new grants management specialist working uh, in, in GMB. Uh, he's also been working with us as a contractor for a few years uh, now and, and previously worked in, in grants administration at Duke University uh, and at Wells Fargo as well. Uh, so he'll be working in, with many of you as, as grantees as, as a specialist uh, working with our um, uh, Alicia Zorn has joined the Hazardous Substances Research Branch, aka the Superfund Research Program, uh, as a health specialist. Uh, she was previously a contractor supporting uh, our Genes, Environment, and Health Branch, uh, and specifically the Target 2 Consortium and our Oceans and Human Health Program. Uh, and in the Superfund Program, she's going to, her primary responsibility is going to be working as the, the core for their communications and information uh, transfer contract. Uh, but she's also going to be handling a lot of their writing and communications efforts uh, within the Superfund program. So those are our, our new people. Uh, we'll have many, many more I hope to, to introduce to you in February. Um, some activities that we've been working on since, since the June Council meeting. Um, uh, it's actually, we've been focusing so much on recruitments that we haven't done as much uh, uh, workshop and what have you, but we, we have had uh, a few uh, uh, sessions with our, our diversity scholars uh, presenting their work, as well as a meeting of our driven network. That is the, the kind of network that we have assembled of our uh, fellows on our diversity supplement program, uh, really uh, uh, 
kind of a cornerstone of our uh, DEIA activities uh, within the extramural community. Uh, we also had a, a, a joint workshop organized with NCI uh, from our, our Cancer and Environment Work Group on uh, molecular signatures of exposure in, in cancer. Uh, so a lot of recommendations coming out of that that you may see and some, some program ideas coming forward in the not too distant future. Uh, and then I wanted to highlight this uh, meeting that we held in this room uh, at the end of July. Uh, for the first time, we held a joint grantee meeting of our ONES uh, Outstanding New Environmental Scientist uh, grantees, as well as our RIVER R35 uh, Outstanding uh, Independent uh, or Outstanding Investigator Awards. Uh, and you know, had a, a series of presentations. I think we had a total of 24 presentations uh, through a two-day two meeting. Uh, highlighting you know the, the work that our grantees are doing both from the the uh, early stage investigators as well as the more established investigators uh, and even had a panel involving the five uh, river awardees that we have that were also ones awardees um, talking about the, the the potential transitions and 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 the power of these and the I will just say that the level of energy and and creativity in the room uh, was about as high as I have ever seen at a grantee meeting. Um, you know that you, know, you would have somebody talking about the work that they're doing in in DNA repair and talking about the impact on pathways that somebody else who's working in neurodegenerative disease would say, "Hey, we see those same pathways lighting up in ours, and you know, maybe there's an opportunity for some collaboration here." Uh, it was it was really the the, the level of of engagement and and interest was 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 spectacular. Um, ideas that we have coming up or things that we're working on uh, for the next several months, uh, a, a lot of grantee meetings. Uh, so we'll be having a lot of conversation highlighting work that we have going on, uh, including uh, work uh, uh, later this month, uh, meetings of our, our children's centers as well as the, the worker training disaster supplements. Uh, we'll also have the, the, the full uh, fall awardee meeting for the worker training program in here in October. Our core centers will be meeting in Houston in October. Um, we'll have a, a meeting of our, our pediatric scholars. Uh, this is the, the collaboration with the Peshus uh, in here in October, a HERE grantee meeting in November, uh, and the Superfund Research Program uh, meeting in Albuquerque in December. And I also want to highlight um, a, a new common fund program that is in development uh, that NIEHS has a leadership role. Uh, we will be holding a, a, a workshop in October. Um, this is a, a program around building NAMS uh, and, and really assessing their potential, uh, the, the, the potential validation and the potential impact of uh, new approach methodologies, uh, not only including organotypic uh, culture systems, but also looking at uh, uh, multi-omic uh, data integration, as well as computational and predictive modeling uh, in the biomedical research. So building on a lot of the conversation that we had yesterday, uh, uh, particularly the work that Thomas Hartung highlighted. Uh, so this is uh, uh, an effort to uh, complement animals uh, in research uh, uh, and evaluation. Um, uh, we also have continued to work on developing our, our translational uh, uh, stories and highlighting the, the impacts of work uh, at our work at, at NIEHS uh, across the, the, the multiple scales of uh, uh, research. Uh, and we've had two more published since, since June, and I think uh, both of these have been highlighted on the NIH uh, in Transformative Impacts webpage. Uh, the, the first is uh, the work from the Alaska uh, uh, Community Action, uh, the, the work on, on St. Lawrence Island, Civic Rock, um, on, on PCB contamination and the impact that that has had on the development of uh, policies uh, around uh, uh, persistent organic pollutant exposures in Alaska, uh, as well as collaborative work from Mount Sinai, Columbia, and Berkeley on uh, uh, pesticide exposures uh, in, in indoor environments and, and uh, policy impacts of, of that research as well. So I, I, I encourage you to go look uh, and, and, and read those uh, and, and see the impacts that we're getting kudos for across NIH. 
So funding strategies. I, I teed some of this conversation up and I'll show some of the same slides that I showed in, in, in June, but I wanna um, come back and have some conversation around very specific strategy proposal that we have uh, for approaching funding for fiscal 24. As, as Rick showed, there is a lot of uncertainty uh, and, and frankly, some, some consternation about the potential realities of a fiscal 24 uh, budget. So I actually want to step back uh, and, and uh, kind of highlight the, the, the grants budget. And so at, at NIEHS, our grants budget is roughly half of the, the total institute budget. So it's a significant amount of money. We're a billion dollar institute. We have $500 million in, in, in grant support. Um, that money doesn't actually all go into competitive grants in, in the year. We don't fund $500 million of new grants every year. Um, it doesn't even all go into grants. Um, so we, we have, um, actually the majority of the money is tied up in out year commitments. So this is about three quarters of that $500 million is money that we spent this year, last year, the year before. We committed to funding the, the, the renewals of the awards that we have. Um, so that, that's money that, that we, we have uh, very little discretion over. Um, we also have essentially no say in, in what we call TAPS. This is money that NIH bills us for doing our business. This supports things like the ERA program, um, um, management of the small business program, what have you. So, so this is uh, several hundred thousand dollars uh, every year that we have to pay to, to NIH just to be able to do the business that we do. And then for our competing awards, we can think of this as, as aligning into two bins. Uh, so one is kind of our own programmatic priorities. This is things that are, are solicitations that, that our staff and leadership development, uh, things like the Exposure on Coordinating Center that, that we just released. Um, the, the prioritization of programs that align specifically with our strategic plan and the implementation of our strategic plan. And then things that, sometimes there are things that we wanna do anyway, um, but external pressure that we have. We'll, we'll, we'll get directives from Congress, from the White House, from NIH, that these things are priorities uh, and uh, you will invest in them. Uh, and some of these, like the environmental justice things that we, we, we discussed in, in Rick's presentation, we're, we, we, we're, we're, we're completely on board with these. Uh, actually, all of these. I don't think there's any that we oppose to. Um, but they do, we, we do have to place emphasis on these. We had specific language in our budget this year uh, to increase our investments in Parkinson's, for instance. Uh, and, and so we do that. Every year we hear pressure from NIH to, to increase our investments in early stage investigators, new investigators, and those investigators who are, are, are characterized as being at risk. That is, they, they have one or fewer grants and they are at risk of, of having to close their, their lab down if they don't. And then, of course, we place a very high priority on investigator-initiated science. That is the ideas that, that you as our grantee community have uh, for research uh, you put in your investigator-initiated application, and if it scores well, we want to fund it. Um, so there's the, it's a zero-sum game. Um, we, you, those are the four bins. We, sometimes we can move money from one to another. Um, sometimes we have relatively li limited capability of doing that. Um, this is a slide that I showed in June. This is a, a, a recap of our, our fiscal 22 budget. Um, and, and really, there's two points of, of, of emphasis here. Um, first is to highlight that the, the majority of our budget, so 75% of the 75% of our budget that is in RPGs, is already committed. Uh, we, we've promised to spend that money. Uh, so while we have uh, for our, our, our research project grants, which is about 75% or about 70 of our, our total grant funding, $280 million, we really only have about $70 million available to fund new competing research. That we also have flexibility, so we have other budget lines such as our, our centers program, our training, our small business, and what we call the other research line. 
Um, other research includes a, a, a wide variety of things um, that are, are things like career development grants, our short-term training grants, the R25s. Uh, it also includes some, some programs that we've intentionally built for uh, infrastructure and capacity building. So things like our cohort maintenance program, the HERE program, the, the children's translational centers are, are all funded out of that other research line. Um, so you know, the, 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 there are, are different pools and, and different distributions of uh, different kinds of grants that, that we make. Um, so I, I want to spend a little bit of time um, digging into what does the word pay line mean? Um, there's a definition of, of, a, of what a pay line is, and, and it's a set point at which the default assumption is that all applications up to that level will be paid. Um, very occasionally, there can be an application that scores within the pay line that, that does not get paid. Um, and almost all institutes maintain flexibility to uh, uh, pay applications beyond the pay line. And, and those are, are, we typically refer to them as raise to pays. Other institutes call them select pays. But they're programmatic priorities that we say, we think that this is an important project, we're going to fund it. The pay line is not the same thing as a success rate. Uh, so, so many people conflate these. The pay line is, is that fixed number from NIEHS long standing uh, tradition, we've defined that as a 10% pay line. If your percentile score is 10, 10th percentile or better, the default assumption is you, you will be paid. A success rate is the number of applications that are awarded divided by the number of applications that are reviewed. And that is a number that is almost always higher than the, the pay line. Across NIH, the average is between 18 and, 20th and 20 percent success rate at NIEHS. We are typically a little bit lower, more in the 15 to 16 percent success rate. Uh, just want to be transparent. Shifting between budget lines, so whether that's that programmatic priority, investigator initiated, or whether that's in, in solicited research, uh, the other line, the training line, what have you. As long as the numbers and the, the, the budgets of those projects remain fairly constant, the success rate is, is going to be determined by the budget more than, than, than any priorities that we make or, or decisions that we make. Um, important to note that each of the 24 grant-making ICE institutes at NIH approaches pay lines and, and, and these decisions very, very differently. We all have the, 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 the ability to determine our own uh, uh, funding strategies and, and, and policies. So there are a few institutes like NIGMS or NICHD that do not have a pay line. Every application that they fund is a raise to pay, is a select pay. There are some institutes like NHLBI that they do very, very few select pays, and therefore they have a pay line that is more in the 15, 17% range, and it will vary based on their budget. So 100%, 99% of their budget goes into pay line, and then they reserve a very small amount for, for select pays. It's just different strategies, different approaches that different institutes use uh, to make their decisions. Uh, so the current practice at NIEHS, uh, and this has been in place for, I think, more than 10 years now, uh, is that we have uh, a, a, a fixed uh, for pay line uh, at the 10th percentile for R01, R21, and R03 applications, uh, uh, the investigator-initiated applications. And this is uh, reflective of a, a mindset that if you score better than 10th percentile, it's good research. It deserves to be supported. Um, we do not have a fixed pay line for uh, other mechanisms such as the, the area awards, Fs, Ks, Ts, SBIRs. We just de define a percentage of our budget into those and we'll make decisions 
um, uh, on individual applications, uh, like those institutes that do not have a, a, a strict pay line. Historically speaking, this uh, mindset of, of a fixed 10th percentile uh, has allow us, allowed us to keep you know, roughly half of the budget that we put into pay line uh, and have that available for raise to pay applications where we have, we have a, a, a series of priorities that we put into that, which is you know, a, a programmatic assessment of what is just really highly innovative and impactful research. What is the best of, of the next 10 to 15 percentile scores? Um, the NIH priority that we, we NIH has a, a target number of early stage and at risk uh, investigators that we want to fund. Uh, and so we are asked by NIH to prioritize early stage investigators and at-risk investigators, which we happily do. Um, we also, and I think this is actually one of those um, kind of unique strengths at NIEHS, uh, we all know that applications, when they come through review, um, there will be two applications that think this is a really strong proposal. They'll give it a two. Uh, and one reviewer who has uh, a, a different opinion, and we'll give it a five. Um, our program staff will look through every summary statement. They will see these disagreements between reviewers, and they will kind of apply a lens that says, you know, yes, we see these concerns. They're concerns that can be addressed. Uh, or no, these are concerns that are real, and the other two investigators didn't see it. And so we will apply a, a, a judgment on the review uh, when there are disagreements between reviewers. Uh, and that will shape the, 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 our uh, uh, priority on placing those as a, a raise to pay. We also, fairly unique at NIH, we have a program analysis branch uh, in extramural. Uh, and so we, we look at where does this application fit in our portfolio? You know, is this a gap? Is this an area where we have significant investment already, or is this an opportunity for us to, to move in new directions and, and, and expand uh, the, the, the reach of our portfolio. The alignment with the strategic priority and with uh, those, those external directives that we get from, from Congress, the White House, and NIH. And then we also um, will, will, will be honest that we kind of respect our existing investments. Um, when we have unique animal models or, or cohorts um, that are at risk, and it's not the investigator themselves that are at risk, it's the resources that we've already invested in that are at risk. Uh, we, we have a commitment to trying to maintain those investments. Uh, so that's another factor that will shape our, our raise to pay decisions. This is another slide that I presented uh, earlier this year, which is reflecting what's a good reality, I think, but it, it is a reality that we have to be aware of, which is that 10th percentile every year is costing us about 10% more than it did last year. The cost of, of just setting 10th percentile is going up, that's inflation. Um, the, the, the average size of a grant is going up, it makes sense. But also, and I think this is a word of encouragement, the number of applications that are fitting, falling within the top 10th percentile is also increasing at about 7% per year. Uh, so we are getting more applications that are getting better scores. So you know, our, our, our science is faring better in CSR reviews than it has historically. That's a good thing. Um, but it does mean that every year it's harder for us to maintain 10th maintain percentile and also have that flexibility to, to raise to pay. Um, so this is kind of looking at the the, the data on the right here is the same data that we had on the left, just uh, pulling out how much of that is in the, the pay line, the unsolicited pay line, our raise to pay, and our solicited research. Um, so you know, we, we've been able to maintain raise to pay because we've been decreasing the amount of money we've been putting into solicited research. That's been, a, 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 I wouldn't say it's a conscious uh, decision uh, but it's been a side effect of, of, of very difficult decisions that we've, we've had to make to maintain this. Uh, prior to our um, uh, defining the fixed 10th percentile pay line, we had a, a stated goal of having roughly half of our budget being in pay line 
and then dividing the other half into solicited research and raise to pay. Now, it can't be precise because solicited research is really, we commit to those solicitations a year or even more before we get there. So we, we put out the, the announcement yesterday for the Exposome Coordinating Center, a million dollar investment from NIEHS for fiscal 24 was released in 23. Um, that was actually a fairly short timeline for us. Um, we also have you know, programs that are, are um, kind of longstanding annual uh, uh, solicitations that, that are commitments that we, we you know, have in our solicited research portfolio. Um, as we look at the fiscal 24 budget, um, so I'm not gonna show you numbers because the budget office gets very nervous when we show dollar numbers, when, particularly when we don't know what the actual landscape is. Um, when the president's budget was released, we did some initial forecasting that said we would be about, you know, based, based on a budget that is flat at fiscal $23 with our anticipated increase in taps and non-competing commitments uh, based on continuing to do business as normal, uh, we anticipated we would be about $6 million short of meeting the 10th percentile pay line uh, at NIEHS. At the time, there was also um, some, some push within Congress to roll back to fiscal 22 funding levels, which would put us about $26 million short of meeting the pay line uh, for fiscal 24. Fortunately, the markup from both the House subcommittee and the Senate keep us flat at fiscal $23. Um, but there's still some rumblings within Congress that there's a push to roll back to fiscal 22. Um, so we, you know, we're based on that. We started playing some some administrative tricks uh, within our our portfolio. So we asked NIH for the authority to make our raise to pay applications as multi-year funded awards. We took an R01. We funded three years this year, which means we don't have a non-competing commitment in 24 or 25 for that application. We do have a non-competing commitment in 26 and 27 for that. That has allowed us to free up somewhere on the order of $20 million next year and the year beyond uh, to, to maintain pay line and to maintain some flexibility uh, to do ways to pay, but it's not, it, it, it's not super safe money. Um, you know, it, it, it's a, a tool to decrease the, the potential pain for 24, but it's not a solution to the problem. Um, so right now we're projecting that we will be able to maintain, if, if we choose to do it, a 10th percentile pay line and have some money for ways to pay. If we get rolled back to fiscal $22, I don't think we're gonna be able to maintain any funds for, for raise to pays. Um, and there's that longer term problem that the cost of maintaining 10th percentile is going up every year and long term it's not sustainable uh, without budgets that also start to go up by 10% per year and I don't think that's realistic to expect that's going to happen. Um, we also need to acknowledge that we have a new strategic plan coming out, as, as Rick mentioned, uh, and you know, we, we are going to want to be able to use the flexibility of raise to pay uh, to, to address the strategic plan. And we know that there are going to continue to be the external pressures uh, on, on uh, investing in particular areas. So I'm, I'm proposing a, a change to the way we do business, um, going back to the way we used to do it. Um, so this is an alternative strategy that allows us to maintain a commitment to the best investigator initiated research, but also uh, guarantees us the ability to have funds available to raise to pay. And that is to uh, go back to, to setting a pay line that is 
roughly 50% of the, the funds that we have available to fund investigator initiated competitive research. Um, maintain about half of that amount, 25% of our, our competing balance available for raise to pay and you know, modeling, trying to keep our solicited research as close to 25% uh, as we, we possibly can. It's not gonna be perfect. Advantage of this is that it, it allows us to do both. Um, it also is, is an approach that scales directly with our budget. If it's a bad year, we're still able to maintain a pay line, we're still able to maintain some, some raise to pay, we're still able to maintain our solicited research. If it's a good year, we just have a more favorable pay line um, with more money available to raise to pay. Uh, and then our, our solicited research will be committed at the levels that it, that it already was. Um, so um, downside, it's not as easy to market. market you know, that 10th percent is a number that we can point to and say 10th percentile, you can anticipate being funded. This round, it might be eighth. The next round, it might be 12th. It just depends on where the budget aligns and, and where the, the, the applications align. So communication around this is gonna be a little bit more challenging. It's a little harder to understand from a conceptual standpoint. Um, so the discussion I would like to have with you uh, fairly quickly um, is kind of your reaction to this. So, so what are your, your thoughts, comments, or concerns on shifting from a pay line that is defined as a percentile score to a pay line that is defined as a percentage of our available budget? Um, and then a secondary question, uh, I, I laid out a number of factors that we uh, have put into our, our raise to pay discussions now. Are there additional factors that, that you would like to see us consider? One that we've talked about internally is a, a concern that I think came up in June uh, with Noni Burns' uh, presentation, which is the challenge of, of orphan applications. Those are, are applications that are reviewed in a study section that have fewer than about five applications within that, that domain. Um, historical data shows that those will score more poorly than when you have a captive study section with you know, 40 to 50 percent of the applications being from a, 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 a single institute. Um, so that's, that's, that's one thing that we've started thinking about as, as a potential consideration for raise to pay uh, on top of the adjudicated differences. With that, I'll stop and I'll turn it over uh, for some discussion. Carrie. Ah, thank you for that straightforward description of the challenges that you're yeah. facing. Um, you, in your last comments, you alluded to some other opportunities that you're considering that allow you more flexibility in decisions. Um, I'm part of the I, uh, Superfund Research Program, mm -hmm. and it's rather prescriptive about how the funds have to be allocated within the proposed center. I wonder if um, that's also true for other funding uh, solicitations, if there's um, opportunities for loosening the requirements on the applicant for, for spending that could also result in better opportunities for funding more centers, more flexibility for you in deciding how to move money around. Yeah, so, so when we design solicitations, you know, it's one of the conversations that we have of, of how stringent do we want to be, you know, how, how, um, you know, how, how strict or, or, you know, kind of what are the parameters for funding. Um, the Superfund, you know, both the Superfund and the worker training being a, a different appropriation that are 100% solicited. Um, you know, we, ha we have some flexibility. We also have some guidance from Congress on how, what their expectations are uh, for, for how those funds are going to be utilized and, and distributed. But we also do have some flexibility um, to, to, to tweak, uh, I, I think, is, is, is the way we, we do that. Um, and we, we also do the same thing you know, with our other kind of longstanding solicitations. Every time we release a new uh, solicitation, um, we, we, we 
we shift things a little bit. I was talking with, with Jenny Collins uh, yesterday uh, about the, the river program um, and you know where we're going to make some small shifts here and there to eligibility and, and, and those kinds of things. So it, you know, very rarely are they wholesale redesign, um, but, but tweaks, yes. We, we, we do have some ability to, to shift things. Um. I could just follow up a bit. Mm -hmm. Your last comment just before my question was um, about how you're considering um, funding allocations about the competitiveness of the solicitation or the, the um, way that you can appropriately review the proposal mm -hmm. instead of proposals. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, so, so this is a, a, a specific concern that has come up around our applications that are reviewed by CSR. Um, you know, so, so those CSR study sections are, are designed to cover a topic within biomedical research, um, not a topic within environmental health research. Uh, so um, and they are assigned to the, the most appropriate study section for the science that they are proposing. Um, and th this is not just true for environmental health. It is true across um, the, the CSR landscape. When you have a, a scientific domain that is underrepresented within that broader focus of the study section, they do across the 50,000 applications that CSR reviews every year, they do comparatively poorly to those where there's a bulk of that science that is in a particular domain. Uh, this was part of the rationale for actually the establishment of what used to be the SIEE study section now is, is the environmental determinants of disease, is we, in partnership with the Society of Toxicology, did some analysis that showed, you know, selectively our portfolio, our projects were not doing well. And so CSR stood up that study section to be a captive environmental health study section. Um, you know, we, 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 we have other pockets of our portfolio that are, are reviewed in similar fashion. And so the, the, the question is, you know, do we, do we take that beyond just that adjudicated look at the review and disagreements between reviewers to actually look at the study section itself um, as, as a factor in potential ways to pay? And Irv, I see you've got your mic on. Yeah. Um. I actually think it's a good idea what, what you're suggesting to keep it at that 50% of what you've got, what you've got allocated and um, then thereby retaining the, the RTP um, at, at, a, at a good enough level. And I, I say that because, I mean, you were just alluding to this, is that um, there are a lot of priorities of, of NIEHS that don't do well overall in, in, in CSR reviews. And, um, EDD, you, you know, you might or might not get it even if you ask for it. Um, as I found out by using my this privilege of as, as a council member using that continuing uh, submission, and um, you know, we got something that had to do with kidney disease, and it was clearly not going to. And we had no kidney disease in our grant at all. Um, so uh, I, I think it, I think it does make sense, and you know, just looking at what options there are and aren't um, with with a shrinking budget like that. Um, I think one of the other concerns, and, and it's actually a little bit related to um, I've forgotten the name who just spoke, uh, that um, the the demands not just on these program uh, centers and so forth. But even for un unsolicited um, applications, particularly some of the increasing requirements related to data sharing, is um, it, you know it's actually a, a pretty onerous thing the data sharing, um, and uh, you know the Echo program. You know we were asked to submit not just the data we were collecting under Echo, but all data that we had collected in those cohorts, and some of our cohorts our cohorts might have been going on for 10 years, you know, before we came into the ECHO program, and, um, uh, you know, it, that, 
that, that's one of the you know sort of added requirements that that, um, that that can be possible. And you know, I think um, similarly for the DEI, I mean, a lot of those activities are not there's not necessarily a cost clearly in them um, to really uh, try and develop uh, you know work out. Uh, programs that that are going to um, increase you know, diversity in the workforce and things like that, but but there can be um, uh, if you do s certain things right, where you're working with community partners, and you know it's all, it is absolutely appropriate and, and sort of morally uh, uh, an imperative, I think, to to pass funding on to community partners that are working with you and putting in time and effort. So. Um, so yeah, so I, I think there's you know <laughs> there's this push pull uh, about um, the funding that's that uh, that's available and you know at one point I was thinking I mean not just now but in my head uh, thinking about um, the grants and the strategies towards um, especially as we're advising our, our younger colleagues um, of uh, you know wouldn't it be good if you know pay limits were a little higher um, so that people could actually write larger grants to cover some of these um, other uh, other requirements that didn't used to be part of, of doing, doing environmental health research. Yeah, I mean, well, so I, I would say, you know, you should be requesting a budget that allows you to do what you're proposing to do. Um, you, and and no more than that, uh, but but a budget that, that that is sufficient to to meet the needs of the project that you are proposing. Um, I will um, because you, you you touched specifically on the the, the costs and, and challenges of, of data sharing. I will remind that the the, the new data sharing plan um, does allow for an, an additional budget uh, to be a, incorporated into your application. That's going to place more pressure on us to, to. I mean, it's going to increase the average cost of an award. Um, but I, I think that's a cost that that is worth paying. You know, the, if you look at the conversation we had yesterday, I, I, I think it was an understated tone of the conversation. But those models are only as good as the data that they are built on. And if the data is not available, the models are not going to be very good. Um, so these efforts to get data out there. Are really very critical to to being able to do the things that we would like to be able to do in the future to capitalize on new technologies and capabilities. Yeah, thank you for reminding me that that there's actually this uh, that option of, of extra funding for that. And um, uh, on you know, uh, and of course it does mean if you if awardees are getting more funding, then fewer awardees are going to get funded. And, uh, yeah. And I think that that's actually, from the point of view of the Exposon program, I think that's really huge because, um, you know, the, the deposition of omics data and ensuring that the, all of the curation and documentation means that people using your data really understand, you know, all those limitations. Um, and I mean, I, I just see there, you know, these issues of fraud and that. The, Ease with which the bigger the data, <laughs> the more ease of, of uh, you know both mistakes you know and um, and uh, deliberate um, you know butting with the data can um, can really bring really bring the science the quality of science down and, and that is something I think we need to worry about a lot. Yeah, thanks thanks for that concern. I think that's something we can look into, Gary. <laughs> Yeah, so I understand the budgetary pressures, and I, I like the 10%, but I ex appreciate that approach there. The concern, though, is about totally removing it, is when a person gets a grant score, now they have no idea. Like, can we at least say there's a hard 8.5 or 8, <laughs> and then squishy after that? Be just because I think that otherwise, like, people might think I get a 7th percentile, I may not get funded, which they are, but they're going to hear that, well, now there's nothing guaranteed. Yeah, and that is that is an option that we have, have explored is a, a, a lower fixed percentage um, as, as we're, we're already 
if not the lowest, one of the lowest fixed percentages across NIH. So, you know, kind of thinking about your comments at the last council meeting, you know, if word gets out that funding at NIH is, is you know, they're only funding to the seventh while NHLBI is going to the 14th, 15th, you know, that may steer some people in other directions. Um, so I, 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 I hear what you're saying. I, I, I understand and I don't disagree right. with you. And, I just and worry and about maybe it's just more like an unwritten thing. You know, the idea like, so if, if, uh, if a grantee contacts a program officer and they're at seven, that they can be told, it's like, oh yeah, you're fine. Like yeah. it's a squishy yeah. nine to 10 sort of thing. But it, otherwise, like people waiting all the way to council when they had a nine percentile or a seven percentile, they, there's the anxiety from that is not yeah. trivial. Yeah, I, I, I hear you, I, I understand. Just to tag team onto that, because I, I think it's understanding the system is really difficult, right? Especially for early stage investigators. Yeah. The other thing that I really worry about is you do get an eight percentile, you don't get funded, and you're like, I'm going to industry. I'm going to somewhere else. And I, I just feels like we are losing folks because it is hard it's really hard and you know there is a breaking point so i but i i know that budgets are budgets right and so i think just understanding it clearly is really important because i've just talked to a few people off the ledge you know <laughs> where they're just so frustrated they just want to say that or just say i'm just going to teach i'm just not going to do this research yeah. thing so if I, if, if I could make a, a comment on this. Um, what I worry about is the stress you're putting into the system. I think this is what you're hearing, in that you can have an investigator who's very hopeful of getting funded, and then they hear at the last minute they're not. And under your plan, which I understand is very pragmatic, you could have an issue where somebody puts in a grant one year and gets an eighth percentile, and then because of where that fits in the budget period, the investigator then gets a grant funded at 12%. And the investigator that was unfunded at 8% is then going to be not only stressed out, but actually question the fairness of the system. So I have another solution for you, and I raised this before, and you can think about it. I'd like you to model um, how much each R01 is coming in at. I made the point before we have this modular budget system that no one uses anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of people come in close to the budget limit of 500K, 449 or 499. And you have to ask is whether or not that money is really justified. You have to ask whether or not there's inflation in the budget. And many investigators might do that because they anticipate a cut when the award is made. My recommendation would be to reintroduce a cap on R01s, but make it more reasonable, maybe 350K. It's then up to the investigators to reduce the scope of work in that R01, and there'll be there for more money to go around. And then you could keep exactly what you're doing right now, 10 percentile perhaps, and raise to pay. Yeah, I, so the, the, I, th I think there's two different issues there. So one is, is the use of modular budget, and that's, that's something that's beyond our control. Um, that, that's a, a, a big NIH policy. Um, uh, I, there has been some analysis and discussion on it, and Rick, I don't know if you want to share thoughts of what's, what conversations you've been part of. Um, across NIH, modular budgets are now less than 20% of all applications. Um, so it is, it is definitely... You know, when, when we first started doing them in the early 2000s, it was 80% of all applications, I think. Um, so they are definitely decreasing. Um, there has been conversation about expanding that scope. Um, we have had conversations about you, one of the other things that, that you suggested, which is, you know, having program officers go through budgets with a fine tooth comb. Uh, and and you know, really being very selective about what gets funded and what doesn't. I'll be blunt, I don't have the staffing levels to be able to do that for every application that we fund. Um, we, we look through with a course comb and, and make judgment calls, but to look through with the fine level of detail, I don't, I don't think we can, I don't think we have the staff hours to be able to do that. Um, 
putting in a budget cap is not something that we've explored, but I think that that's, that's an option that, that you, I know that there are other institutes that have different pay lines based on budget. Um, so the larger your budget is, the lower the pay line that you're going to have is. Um, and you know, that, that might be an option that, that allows us, you know, keep 10th percentile for a number and we'd have to look in, at modeling as you suggest and, and see what that is. And then if you're over that, your pay line is, is somewhat shorter or lower percentile. That, that's an option. As an investigator, when we put in a grant application, we always have to put in the PAR number that goes with what we're applying mm -hmm. for. It's conceivable that NAHS could issue its own PARs for R01s with a budget cap. Let me just, if I could just chime in here, it's, we also want to make sure that we're not losing some of our best investigators. So if we put in a budget cap of, say, 350 for an R01, you know, someone's going to look at this and say, well, you know, gee, why don't I look at um, NIA or you know, NINDS or, or NIMH or other places? So I don't think that we want to be very purposefully positioning ourselves so that we're not going to get, you know, the, the best, you know, possible work. So I just worry about that. Um, and, you know, the, you know the, the budget cap would be that you're effectively coming in with a smaller proposal. Um, doing less work. So I don't know, just something to be thinking about as well. I think, you know, Gary's, at least we took your, your comments to heart, but we don't want to be doing things that would uh, point you or others to be, you know, submitting your excellent work to other ICs. I mean, in, in the end, it's the NIH is funding it, and that's good. Uh, but we'd like to think that um, there will be things that, you know, we want to keep our, our best you know, investigators, you know, as part of our funding portfolio. Karen, it looked like you were going to the microphone. Yeah, I am. Um, I, so maybe NIH can make some change because I think the budgets are absolutely ridiculous. I think that people could, do, and they can reduce the scope a bit. You can have, you know, we all have multiple R01, so it's not like you would necessarily lose someone. For multiple Karen, projects, can you speak towards the microphone? For multiple projects, yeah. but I do think that some of the budgets, I mean, even on study sections, you know, we have a say about budgets as reviewers, right? And we'll say, this can be cut in half. And it, even, they, we say, remove X modules. You know, X, and they do, and the researchers still get the work done. I mean, I think that these budgets are inflated, and I think that you are losing people by having such a low percentile rather than the low budget. Well, suffice it to say that this is a topic under intense discussion amongst IC directors. and. So there's a there's a, a tension between doing something NIH wide that applies to all 27 institutes and centers, and a tension where, you know, the I think Dr. Tabak and Dr. Schwetz still want to you know, make sure that you know institute directors have some flexibility in how they manage their institute. So it, it's all I can tell you is that there's a real dynamic tension, and we'll be talking about this at our leadership forum. And we just want to do things that just make the most sense. And you know, I don't want to do things that specifically would put us in a less competitive position. So um, you know, it's it's so there are lots of uh, complicating variables here. So we'll we'll be you know listening to your input as well as you know I'll be working with my other IC director colleagues and trying to figure out how how do we manage this across the NIH. It's just yeah you know, the. I mean, part of the reason why I went on as long as I did with the budget issue is that um, Dr. Tabak is telling me that, you know, you need to impress upon people that the, the future of the budget, you know, for the NIH, at least in FY24 and 25, is going to be different than what we've experienced over the past several years. And there are a lot of people in the extramural community, especially, that really don't think that this is really going to affect them. Uh, well, it will. And so it's not just NIEHS, but uh, all IC directors at our council meetings are talking about these issues. And we just have to be thoughtful about what we do. Again, the, the, the good news is that we still have actually a, a nice chunk of change to support science. The question is, how do we do this thoughtfully in FY24 and 25? And I don't know what's going to happen after FY25. That's going to be, I think, pretty much a function of the next election and other sorts of things. So. We just have to be responsible and thoughtful about how do we distribute the funding. Indeed. 
Andre, last thoughts, because then we need to move on. Um, Can I ask a question, though, the, after you go? Um, one of the, what I did not hear clearly um, was about new investigators. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I know in the students I talked to, um, there's just a lot of uh, lack of enthusiasm about pursuing academic careers because of these challenges. Yes. Um, and it's getting worse and worse all the time. So uh, whatever you do, I, I would ask that you really take into consideration yep. uh, development and, and some kind of emotional support for by funding um, uh, new investigators. Yeah, yeah. So, so we, we we do look at at every ESI application um, up up to about twenty five percent. We don't fund them all um, because we can't, uh, but we we do look carefully at them and, and they all get consideration, um, you know, pr pretty carefully. Um, so, so yes, we, we we do recognize that. We also do look at at, um, and I actually heard that one of the institutes was was formalizing this, the looking at benefit for the first renewal of an award. So it's it's not just the first award, but it's it's staying in the pipeline. So that's that's also something that we've never really we 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 talk about it with our like our ones investigators. We highlight those. Um, but we don't really look at it across all of our ESI investigators. So I think uh, you, you raise good points. Uh, and the other thing I will say is, I mean, our program staff are fantastic. And, and you know, they, they are available for some career counseling for all of your early stage investigators. And they will, they will hold their hand through the process. They will, 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 will give them good guidance uh, and, 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 and as much help as we possibly can because... Yeah, the, that's the future, uh, and we need to maintain our investment in the future. Yeah, maybe I can just chime in here, too, and to reassure you that this is a topic of great interest and concern across the NIH, so it's not just NIEHS, uh, but there are essentially you know, mandates coming from Dr. Tabak that we fund X number of ESIs. So he actually on a, what is it, a monthly or a, it seems every, like it's a weekly basis. Every month. Uh, we, I get an email um, letting us know where are we on this and just encouragement, you know, pay attention to this. So, and then in fact, at the last IC director's meeting, Dr. Tabak specifically indicated that he implores that we look at the ESIs and at risk investigators. So if your grant is coming in and you're at risk of losing your program, he wants us to, to continue to, to look carefully at, at those uh, applications, especially the early stage investigators. And part of this is coming from Congress. Uh, so they want to make sure that the future of, of biomedical science, which is early stage investigators, that they feel that there is a future and that there's money available to support their grants. And also looking, you know, the kind of the reality, when you look at the, the details, there are a lot of very senior investigators that are sopping up a lot of the NIH budget. So that's also a topic of discussion. It's, uh, is that fair, um, where you have senior investigators with large um, uh, research groups you know, taking a disproportionate amount of the budget? Um, so how, how do we handle that? So again, these are topics that are under intense discussion. Okay, Irvin, last thought. Yeah, no, it's not a thought, just a question, uh. actually. So, um, you know, we often put in multiple institutes on the, the, the form. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and occasionally I've had conversations with program officers about co-funding. I've never actually seen it happen. And, um, it, you know, in this climate now where um, may, well, I guess there's always been many institutes on, on a lot of our RFAs, but um, it, it I'm, but it does seem like some of those um, ties across the the centers through some of your work, Gwen's work, and other others from here um, have strengthened those ties, and maybe there would be more um, more interest from other other institutes. You know, so many of the, the topics, that especially in IEHS covers, are, there's another institute that covers the diseases. So, um, 
Am I right that it rarely happens? And it, well, it's, it's, it will happen increasingly so in the future. And that's, again, my commitment is that, you know, the partnerships with other ICs, we can bring the environmental health component to studying the etiology of human disease. So that just makes sense. Uh, so the very you know, tangible examples would be the climate change and health, um, the, uh, the work that we're doing with, uh, with, actually with several other ICs, where it's not just, or, or the other uh, very tangible example is the work we're doing on DR2. So in the past it was, well, NIEHS would, would come up and would manage this on our own, uh, but now we're actually reaching across. We're working in partnership with several other uh, ICs. And in fact, what it means is that I don't have to come up with the entire budget to fund the National Academy workshop. In fact, I'm funding you know, a fair amount given our budget, but others, MCI, uh, CDC, and others are coming up to help support that. So your point is well taken, and I think it's, it just makes a lot of sense. Beyond workshops and grants. Well, absolutely. It's it's uh, it's it just these are steps in the direction, but it gets back to the discussions we had yesterday. It's just in you know impressing upon you know my colleagues across the NIH that the environment makes a difference and that you've got to pay attention to the environment. Um, it's complex, but you know part of our responsibility is to actually build the tools. So if you want to know how to do an exposome experiment, it's our responsibility to define that. And so hopefully the center that we are, we're funding is going to help to develop those operational details that will help us to engage with our colleagues across the NIH and across the biomedical enterprise. I mean, that would be a, a very welcome change, you know, that in so many years I was doing work on autism and NIMH, you know, uh, my, my grants would just get smashed yeah. in their reviews um, that because it was environment and, and mental health. Well, and this is a, another great example of how, you know, Josh Gordon is, you know, he, he talks to me and said, look, Rick, I'm very interested. You know, tell me how I do an exposome experiment. Okay, so let's, that's our responsibility. So uh, it can't be everything about everything. It's, you know, defining how you do this. And Didn't so... Didn't you have the NIA, so the last... Last meeting, I think you were talking about interactions with NIA. I, I have. So I, I've actually it's been it's been really quite pleasant. So I've been invited to give presentations at uh, quite a number of other ICs: so NHLBI, NHGRI, NIA, uh, NIAMS, uh, and actually two or three others. So it seems like every council period, uh, and I'm going to be giving a talk at NIDCR in January. Uh, I gave a talk at NICHD, so there's a lot of interest uh, in what we do, which is terrific. So it's uh, actually getting exactly at Irva's point here, is that we need more of this crosstalk, and we shouldn't have to take this on by ourselves. What about NCI? I do know I had an R. And, and the NCI. And yeah, in fact, we have so a very, you know, I, I wish I, that I, I, I could I have taken all the time. I but we're significantly yeah, we're way over schedule. time, so let's talk some more about this. <laughs> Um, so I would like to, to um, move on to the next presentation, please, uh, and have uh, Kim McAllister speak to us about one of our partnerships um, with NCI and, and Human Genome. Okay, good morning. It is still morning. Um, so I'm here to try to give you um, an informational report, an update on um, a new trans NIH multi-omics consortium that NIEHS is participating in uh, with NHGRI and NCI. Okay. Uh, um, and this is really uh, a consortium effort that aligns well with many of the efforts that NIEHS has been working on in the framework of precision environmental health, um, which Rick mentioned this morning already, um, and you've heard about in, in a lot of previous council discussions. Uh, this figure here is actually from um, the paper that was recently published from Dr. Baccarelli. Dr. Delnoy and Dr. Walker, and it was based primarily on the presentation um, that they gave uh, first at this council. 
Um, and so we're kind of expecting, um, again, as Rick mentioned, that this is going to be part of our new strategic plan. And the idea is to identify exposure response relationships with multi-systems approaches, including multi-omics, to predict disease risk with an overall goal of really focused on prevention and intervention um, rather than just treatment of disease, which is what you tend to hear more with uh, the term precision medicine. And as everyone knows, there's been this explosion of omics data in recent years. And I'm defining omics as a distinct biological layer of regulation. So of course, there's genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, epigenomics, metabolomics, and, and many others. And we know that many environmental factors do induce biological responses at many levels. Um, there's interactions between our environmental risk factors and many omics layers that do drive complex disease outcomes. So it's really critical that the environment be integrated into multi-omics studies. There's also been some recent papers that have shown that if you look at a combination of multiple omics with environmental data, rather than, say, just looking at a single omics layer, you can get greatly improved risk predictions and confidence for detecting uh, environmentally relevant pathways. And this really makes sense that you, you actually have a more comprehensive view, capturing all the molecular perturbations in cells that lead to adverse outcomes. And this can lead to better mechanistic insights. So there is a lot of excitement about uh, multi-omics analysis approaches combined with environmental data to really try to improve classification of disease into clinically relevant subgroups and potentially identify biomarkers of both disease and exposure. However, um, there are a lot of challenges that remain which really prevent routine application of multi-omics to disease studies. And that's because all of these different omics layers are highly interconnected um, and correlated and really complicated to truly in integrate in meaningful ways. And then we know, of course, with respect to integrating environmental exposure data with other omics platforms, we have a lot of challenges that we're all um, pretty aware of. Our environmental exposure data is highly heterogeneous. It's measured on um, different scales, using different instruments, different surveys. There's really a lack of methods to analyze a lot of our high-dimensional environmental data. Uh, we have to deal with the, the dose and the timing of exposure. And then there's a, a known lack of data analytical tools, databases, and ontologies to assess multivariant longitudinal data and environmental mixtures. We um, had at NIH two different workshops in recent years that really attempted to explore this topic of a lot of the challenges of multi-omic studies in depth. And the first one was uh, this one here from NHGRI. And they have had a long-standing interest in multi-omics tools and technologies and approaches uh, related to, to all kinds of different multi-omics um, applications. And some of the recommendations from this workshop really focused on the need to explore best study designs, approaches, tools, as well as consensus analysis pipelines and best practices for multi-omics projects. There was uh, recognized a real need to make a harmonized and standardized multi-omics data set more broadly available to the scientific community. Um, there was also recognition that more diversity was needed in terms of ancestry or ethnic representation in the omics collections that were available. And then finally, um, we did have some of our NIEHS grantees at this workshop and uh, as speakers, and they did address the lack of methods specifically for integrating a lot of our environmental exposure data with other omics data. Um, this is the second workshop, workshop that took place uh, more recently this past February. This was actually the first workshop that came out of a cancer and environment working group 
that uh, has been meeting for a couple of years now to discuss a lot of different collaborative projects between NCI and NIEHS. Um, and so this workshop did focus more specifically on how do we integrate a lot of our environmental data with other omics data in the context of cancer epidemiology. And I should say that NIEHS and NCI has had um, a lot of collaborative efforts um, over the last 20, 25 years or so, really focused on GBIE uh, because it is a substantial part of both uh, institutes' uh, portfolios. And this is really just the latest example of, of an effort. This workshop in February really reiterated a lot of the same recommendations that the previous NHGRI workshop had touched on. And I should say most of these recommendations are relevant to a wide uh, variety of complex diseases, not really just cancer. Um, so some of the key points from this workshop were really to think about expanding multi-omic studies to include immunology, microbiome data, and exposome measures. There was a really strong emphasis to not ignore social determinants of health, especially now that we have um, such a wealth of geospatial data and electronic health records data that can um, provide a lot of rich information about um, SDOH. Um, there was a, also um, a, a lot of emphasis on what we could do if we could actually measure multiple omics in the same individual, the same tissue, same time point, and do multiple time points, um, as well as thinking about how we can correlate different omic signatures across samples. Um, the need for new innovative computational approaches or methods especially for integrating a lot of different types of environmental exposure data with other omics data was emphasized. And then finally, again, the point of, can we just make a comprehensive omics data set more broadly available to the wider scientific community was also emphasized. So I'm happy to announce now that there is this new consortium effort that is starting actually this month. And it is a joint effort, NHGRI is leading this, but there's gonna be a very heavy involvement from our institute as well as NCI. And um, this really uh, is very relevant to the recommendations that came out of both of those workshops that I just mentioned. So it is going to attempt to establish some best practices and develop a lot of methods uh, focused on integration of omics with uh, environmental exposure data. It's going to try to measure multiple omics as well as social determinants of health and many environmental exposures on the same individuals uh, in the same tissues, same time, in a longitudinal study. And it's going to place a strong emphasis on um, ancestrally diverse populations as well. This is the overall goals of the consortium. So it is going to attempt to use multi-omics data sets to identify molecular signatures or profiles uh, associated with various disease states. It's gonna attempt to develop some generalizable data harmonization, integration and analysis methods, as well as best practices and standards. And then finally, it is gonna to try to create that multi-dimensional data set um, available to the wider scientific community, and it is um, attempting to make that interoperable so that it can be um, shared with a lot of other existing omics resources. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so this is the overall program structure. This um, consortium is going to have three different components. So it's going to have a data analysis and coordination center, it's going to have an omics production center, and then it's going to have um, a number of different disease study sites. These three components will form a steering committee along with NIH uh, staff for governance, and then there'll be a bunch of working groups that, of, of course, will do a lot of the work of the consortium. Uh, these are U01 components. And uh, they were actually three separate RFAs that solicited the different parts of this uh, consortium. <clears throat> so I'm just going to go into 
uh, just a little bit more detail about um, each of the three components. So this is the disease study sites. Um, and this is really the heart of the consortium in terms of the, the samples that the consortium will use. And it does have a lot of um, asks for this, for this uh, particular RFA. So there were a lot of requirements. Um, so these were pretty complicated applications. Each um, DSS was asked to select a disease whereby multiomics might inform associations and it actually needed to be a disease where there was progression in the five-year time frame that the consortium would be happening in. Um, so um, this could include diseases that where you might see progression because of a lot of different environmental risk factors. And so, in fact, um, the exposure piece was actually really emphasized and, and heavily encouraged to be a part of this RFA. Um, then in addition to that, in terms of the enrollment, uh, all of them, all of the proposals were asked to have a minimum of at least 300 participants. Um, and uh, there was really a heavy emphasis on um, trying to do something about that lack of diversity in OMIC's um, collections. So because of that, there was this uh, requirement that at least 75% of those um, samples needed to be from an underrepresented ancestral background. And then you had to have very broad uh, consent um, for data sharing um, so that these samples could be shared um, in the widest degree possible. Um, and then there needed to be uh, the th minimum of the three time points of collections of these samples, and there needed to be standard measures for phenotypic and clinical and exposure data, including a lot of social determinants of health. And uh, each of the disease study sites also had to propose omics technologies that were really appropriate for their particular disease and their particular uh, study design. And then finally, um, each of the disease study sites had to contribute to uh, collaborative methods development and data analysis. Um, so again, these were really complicated applications that came in uh, for this particular part of the uh, consortium. And then the OMICS Production Center, they are the ones that are going to be receiving the samples from the DSS sites uh, for data production and provide secure and accessible sample storage. Um, they're going to be using high-throughput omics technologies to produce at least five omics data types and then deliver that data to the DAC. The exact omics that will be part of this consortium will most likely include um, the five that are shown here, um, but could include some others depending on what the consortium as a whole uh, really determines as feasible. And then additionally, the OPC will contribute to consortium-wide protocol development and data analysis and methods development as well. Um, and so this is the last uh, component. This is the DAC, the Data Analysis and Coordination Center. So they're going to, of course, be coordinating all the different consortium activities and logistics. Um, the first year is going to be a big planning year for the consortium, and the DAC will be coordinating a lot of that consortium-wide protocol development, as well as a lot of the data analysis and methods development in later years. They are going to be responsible for managing all the data uh, produced by the consortium, and they're going to be uh, facilitating data submission to the ANVIL platform. And if you're not familiar with Anvil, this is a cloud-based, scalable, and interoperable platform that was originally established to allow broad collaboration and secure computing across a, um, a lot of different large genomic data sets. Um, so this is going to be the platform that, it, that uh, this consortium will be using. Um, and then ultimately, they will be creating this multi-dimensional data set and they will be responsible for uh, coordinating all the out final outreach and dissemination activities. So those are the three components, and this is the general timeline for this consortium development. Um, 
The RFAs were released um, uh, earlier in the fall, and then they had a receipt date later in the fall. Um, and the um, the three separate RFAs, again, uh, for those three components were reviewed separately in the spring as three different reviews. And then we had um, funding plans in May. And so the awards in the press release is actually happening right now. And I'll say something about that in just a minute. Um, and we already have scheduled the initial virtual kickoff to happen in just a couple of weeks at the end of September. And then the first in-person meeting will be in January. Um, so this is the consortium timeline moving forward. And um, in order to achieve the goals of this program, you can imagine that the different components are going to have to really work hard to, to achieve a lot of collaboration and a lot of coordination. Um, and for this reason, the whole first year of the consortium is going to be this big planning year where um, network-wide protocols are going to be developed and plans for methods and, and for analysis are all going to happen. And um, of course, the DAC is uh, going to coordinate a lot of that. Um, year two of the program will be devoted to starting the actual enrollment of the participants and uh, collection of the baseline samples. And um, those will then, of course, be submitted to the Omics Production Center to begin Omics data production. Uh, year three and four will then continue that with subsequent measures and samples being collected, um, uh, continuous omics production happening, and then um, lots of standardization and harmonization of the data. So then hopefully by year five, the last year, there will be uh, final analyses happening and then hopefully the focus can um, go to data release and dissemination. So referring back to those two workshops and the challenges that I previously mentioned, um, this consortium is really trying to tackle many of these most pressing issues. I think it's um, really going to hit a lot of those points that um, are pain points. So with the production and standardization of multiple data types from the same sample, that will be really nice for looking at intra and interomic variability. Um, really helpful for thinking about the issues of non-uniform content across platforms and assays, the lack of consensus approaches for QA and imputation. Um, because the computational methods remain underdeveloped in this field, there's going to be a big push in this consortium to really focus on uh, developing new innovative computational methods. And that will be to integrate, analyze, and interpret um, multiple omics from the same sample, but also to be able to integrate uh, environmental and clinical data with um, multi multiple omics. And then finally, um, to have available a well-described and harmonized metadata set um, that can be shared very broadly is, is the ultimate goal. So these are the um, environmental exposures um, that are going to be very prominent in this consortium. So we actually have kind of most of the our heavy hitters of air pollution, heavy metals, endocrine disrupting chemicals, as well as microbiome data and many social determinants of health in there. And four out of the six of the D DSS awards um, really do have a, a very strong environmental emphasis. Um, and we at NIEHS are co-funding three out of those four. And these are diseases that uh, do have environment playing a role in onset progression and exacerbation. And uh, I can say that many uh, exciting computational methods, including AI, are um, proposed to, especially for integrating a lot of exposure data with other um, omics data. Um, so this was going to be my last slide. But um, actually, um, we did not think that the awards were going to be uh, out by today, and we did not think that the press release was going to happen by today. But it actually did happen um, yesterday. The press release came out um, less than 24 hours ago, and so I'm allowed now <laughs> 
to share with you who actually uh, was awarded uh, for this consortium. Um, so this is what it looks like. Um, the Omics Production Center is um, going to be the Wash U Center, and that is um, Dr. Gary Patty as the main PI. Um, some of you know him. He, we actually have a river grant here at NIHS with him to develop different me metabolomics technologies for exposures. Uh, the Wash U Group has a lot of expertise. Um, in consortium experience and in a lot of the different omics. His co-PI is, um, or, or MPI is Ting Wang, um, who is, uh, many of you know him as well. He is actually analyzing all the data for our Target 2 consortium right now. Um, so they are very familiar with all kinds of different exposure data. The DAC, the Data Analysis and Coordination Center, is going to be led by Zeping Wing, who has a very strong, strong track record of consortium management. Um, she has been very heavily involved in, in code. Um, oh, sorry, just, just, oops. Uh oh, I think I lost it. Lost it, Nathan. Sorry. Um, yeah, Zeping Wing is very heavily involved in a number of different omics consortium. Sorry, what's this? Okay. Um, uh, and, and a number of the people from the UMass that are on that application really have a lot of different um, omics uh, uh, consortium experience. There's members that are have been heavily involved in Framingham, he heavily involved in Top Med, and a number of others. And then for the disease study sites, um, I, I starred the four that had the major environmental components. Um, all of them have at least some. Um, but the two that have a little bit less are the McCormick application. That one um, is the one that NCI is funding, and um, it is looking at obesity-associated liver disease in an underrepresented Hispanic Latina population. And then Dr. Laurent is looking at preeclampsia, which is a really interesting disease to, uh, I think, apply multiomics to. Okay. And this is the last slide. Um, so these are the four that have the, the major environmental exposure representation. Um, the Corlick application is very strong with Anna Navasacion. Um, Gary Miller is part of that and other Club Columbia folks. They're looking at chronic kidney disease and um, very interested in a variety of toxicants, especially heavy metals. Um, the TOTSI application is looking at pediatric non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in a Hispanic population. Uh, they, you can see they have a variety of different exposures that they're uh, interested in. Um, this group at USC uh, includes David Conti and others that really have a, a long history of uh, developing a lot of integrative approaches for uh, G by E and integrating exposure data with other omics data. The Kelly Award, that third one, is also kidney disease, but it is distinct from the other one in that they're more interested in the diabetes kidney intersection. And they did a, um, an enrollment strategy where they're hoping to ensure that about 40% of their participants will transition to dialysis or transplant in that five-year time frame uh, of the consortium. Um, but they're interested very specifically in those uh, four heavy metals that are listed. And then finally, the Christensen application is interested in asthma in a low-income Hispanic population, um, very heavy on air pollution and um, psychosocial stress and a number of other SDOHs, but also they had some novel microbiome work that they included in, in their application as well. Um, 
So, you know, I think everyone involved is very excited to begin this new consortium effort. I hope I can come back later once this really gets going and give an update on a lot of the specifics of this consortium and what they're able to do. And um, as I mentioned, Gary is part of one of the teams. Um, so I did tell him I would probably put him on the spot if he wanted to say anything uh, about being part of uh, one of the DSS. And, and then I'll open it to any other questions. Yeah, so just a, I, I'm kind of a bit player on this project because uh, as the laboratory work is being done by that core, mm -hmm. you know, that was a very interesting, like, and you didn't know who it was going to be. It was like what was there. So Ana Navas and I, I would say, are more like advisors to this. But mm -hmm. what was nice is that this group is heavily involved in the precision medicine and the CTSA at Columbia, but they're very, they very much want the environmental piece in. And so I think now that we know what lab is doing it, there was concern that there wouldn't be much environmental expertise, but you know, I think that, that Gary Patty's untargeted work should really capture a lot of things and having it across all those studies will be really helpful. So, so I think now that, it's, you know, now that we know who's involved, it'll be very helpful to discuss that. And, and I think that even those that don't list the environment, I, I think the goal would be that that lab captures it for them even if they weren't looking for it. Right, exactly. Any other questions? Yeah. Jenny. I just have one a little concerned. Um, you t talked about having broad consent so that those tissues can be used. Right. That, that's a really, really difficult thing and a losing trust for a lot of communities, including native communities. And that was the big lawsuit, right, with the Havasupai. Right. So, I have mixed feelings on the science side. I know it's interesting science, but it definitely is not a plus for a lot of communities to say, okay, you can do whatever you want with my tissue, so. Yeah, and uh, and so the um, these are gonna be pretty small studies, you know, just maybe 300 uh, per uh, disease site, and so, uh, there's a number of them came in with uh, a new a new population that they were going to try to uh, recruit for it because they felt like reconsenting an existing population, especially if it's a sensitive population, might be really challenging. Um, but within the disease study applications, it, there was a strong emphasis because they were really trying to target um, underrepresented groups that there be a lot of uh, recruitment strategies and outreach to th those um, diverse populations. And I think within that would be a lot of education about you know, how would these samples be used and what kinds of secure protection would be available to make sure that you know, nobody gets a hold of them that shouldn't and, and you know, those sorts of things too. But yeah, yeah I hear your concern. Okay, thank you very much, Kim. That was great. And, and, and thanks for staying on time. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, so what Rick and I have been talking about is um, take a 15-minute break to grab lunch and come back in for the, to do a working lunch for the two concept approvals. We do have to get those done so that we can move forward with those programs if, if we have approval. Um, I'd like to ask, I don't remember who the assigned reviewers for each of them were, um, but if you have travel, Trevor and Karen and Daryl and Carrie, uh, if you have travel concerns, if, if, if we need to potentially switch the order of those, please let me know. Uh, but I, I think the plan will be to, to go ahead and do the, the Epcot first, then worker training. Um, so we'll come back here at, uh, we'll start promptly with Epcot at 1155. Uh, so we're we're 40 minutes, 45 minutes behind. Um, so I, I, I think realistically finishing 1:30 to 1:45.